morning. What's up, everyone? It's Sunday night, which means it's time to wind down your weekend with Bat City Comic Professionals. As always, I'm your host, Shannon, a.k.a. Small Press Shan, here to talk to you about not one, but two weeks worth of independent comics that are going to rock your face off. Um, I'm super excited. I literally could not narrow down what the picks of the last two weeks were going to be. So when I go through all of these books and I'm like, this was the best book of last week, uh, 47 times, it's not my fault. Um, it was just a really great week, great two weeks for comic books. Um, and I've been waiting to tell you about all the ones from last week. And for everybody that came into the store in the last week, you definitely heard me gushing about so many books and I'm glad that I get a chance to tell you about both weeks. Um, it's been a fun, a fun time here at Bat City over the last um, two weeks since we've seen you. We've had some really cool stuff um, going on. We got to, you know, we, we had we had a holiday in there, which is why we weren't here last week. Um, but we've had um, some, like I said, some great books, some great new boxes come out, which I didn't bring. Um, we did some some cool things. Matt and I got to um, go see his family who came to visit, which was really awesome. Um, and they got to see the store, so it was really great. And thank you to everybody um, for, you know, knowing that we're going to be closed on Sunday and hanging out with our family. That was really great. Um, I got to see Taylor Swift, which was awesome. Um, I know there was probably 21, uh, or 210,000 other of you people who also got to see Taylor Swift. If you were one of them, uh, come talk to me about how great it was. And if you didn't get to see it and you want to see, um, and all the videos and talk about it, I'm happy to come talk. I'm happy to hang out and talk about it anytime. Um, but it was, it was a lot of fun. There's been so much. I'm like, what? What has happened? Um, I don't. I don't even know. So many things. Uh, I guess a shout out to Seabreeze Elementary School for having us out um, earlier this week for their uh, family night. That was a lot of fun uh, to get to talk to all the kiddos and get to hand out some comic books. We had. Um, we actually had one of our students from our workshops who comes every month, one of our Story Spelunker uh, Kids Club members at the table with us, and he was handing out comics and telling people what they were about, and then also drawing pictures from the different comics to kind of showcase them and show like how we make comics together in our workshops. So it was really cool to have um, a, an actual like Story Spelunker on site and help with that. So. Um, it was really cool, and of course, um, one of our other volunteers, Brian, was able to go with us, so it was a lot of fun. Um, we've got a lot more coming your way. Uh, while the beginning of April has been busy, it has it is nothing compared to the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you don't know, we have little mini versions of our calendars in store, and I'm just going to pop that up really fast um, and tell you all about it, but we've got... Um, Coming up this Saturday, uh, I will actually be in the morning um, on the 22nd. I will be out helping the Patterson Foundation with their Remake Learning Days event. And if you don't know what that is, uh, Remake Learning was a initiative started in Pittsburgh um, with the help of like the Fred Rogers Foundation and other organizations um, to to help families learn new and inventive ways to learn together, much like Mr. Rogers provided for the world. And it's now spread to be international. And one of the really cool things is the Suncoast Remake Learning is now officially the biggest remake learning event in the world. Um, so it's super cool. There's over 200 events in, uh, Braid in Manatee County, Sarasota County, um, DeSoto County, and what the fourth one is that I already forgot. But there, uh, the four county area along the Sun Coast, there are over 200 events starting April 22nd and running through the end of the month that are all family oriented learning experiences, whether that's reading, uh, writing, STEAM, so science, art, uh, technology, engineering, uh, math, all kinds of amazing. There's a ton going on this weekend because this weekend is Earth Day, so there's going to be a lot of great events everywhere from um, downtown Bradenton to the Moat Aquarium to schools and libraries and things. And Bat City is participating um, in one this weekend with the Patterson Foundation, but we have two of our own. So if you are an educator, we will have an educator rece reception April 27th. So the store will be closing that Thursday night a little bit early uh, 
to open up just exclusively for educators, uh, librarians, teachers, administrators to come in and learn about how they can use comics in their classrooms and get to check out some of the comic books we offer. I'm very excited that a uh, good friend and education uh, coordinator uh, for, for Bat City, uh, Dr. Zachary Stuckelman, will be here um, speaking. And uh, that also means those of you who have met Zach or who haven't had a chance to meet him can come meet him all that weekend, too. Um, we will also be on Saturday, April 29th from 12 to 4. We will have a family fun day that is all geared around our uh, reading academy, which is the Academic Avengers Reading Academy. And there is going to be a ton of fun games, a ton of fun prizes, um, opportunities these for even parents to get involved in different things so that is april 27th from 12 to 4 and it is going to be a ton of fun i'm super stoked for all of the things that we're going to be doing that day um and then uh one week from april 29th is a very important day may 6th and that is free comic book day so we are only two and a half weeks um for yesterday it was three weeks from free comic book day i can't believe it other than the fact that i have stacks and stacks of boxes full, full of the free comics already arriving uh, but i cannot believe we're already there it's going to be a lot of fun stay tuned for some major announcements on what's gonna what free comic book day will look like from bat city but you're definitely not going to want to miss out on that and that's going to start at i think 11 in the morning for uh free comic book day and something that's not at Bat City, but that Bat City uh, is super stoked about and will be participating in in different ways. Uh, coming up is the Ballad of Old Manatee. This is an immersive musical happening over at the historical Mani Manatee Village just down the street from us. Uh, this is written and produced and directed and starring all people local to the area, which is super exciting. Um, and it is about people from the original village of Manatee in the town of Manatee. And those are people who brought this building that Bat City is in. Uh, those are those are who those humans are. So we're really excited to see this musical come to life. We will be it's opening April 21st. It takes place on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. We're going to be checking it out one of the days, but we're also going to be at their talk back session at Ascura on uh, Wednesday, May 4th. May 4th? May 3rd. May 3rd is the Wednesday. Uh, we'll be there that evening to to be talking about uh, how old Manatee has become new Manatee and all of the amazing businesses from the area will be there and we'll be having uh, an in-conversation as well as a chance to learn more from each of those businesses. So um, come check out the musical, donate to, like, buy tickets, keeps the church restored uh, on site, and then keeps the historic Manatee Village able to preserve those buildings. Uh, we have a lot of comics, like I said, to talk about. I'm going to pull this up so um, I can share it really fast. And before I get started super fast, um, I'm going to talk about the fact that we are drinking debonair wine. This is a Cab Sab. Uh, it's a California wine, which I feel like is what we mostly get to see um, from those like grocery store wines. Um, but are you just okay? This is um, it's Cab Sab. It is one of those that's known for um, smooth flavors. I'm not gonna lie, we had this at a ladies' night at the beginning of this month, so I do already know what this one tastes like. But I'm super excited. This is actually a 2020 bottle, which is funny because that's when Matt and I learned to enjoy red wine and change the name of the show to Wind Down Your Weekend. So this is kind of a little uh, anniversary, which I think happened about this time uh, in 2020. So I guess this is a little uh, anniversary moment for us with wine, but yeah, super smooth. I say we had this at Ladies and I feel like I drank most of it the other day. So I'm glad that I have somebody to share it with today. Um, I am speaking of sharing I'm going to share this really fast that we're talking about comics so people can come join us whoop whoop all right and hello to everybody who did join in I'm super excited that you're here um, let's talk about comics because I don't want to keep you here until the end of time um, but this will be like my own I feel like this is my own little mini eras tour because I'm gonna probably talk to you for three hours and 15 minutes no, I'm just kidding definitely not good not my plan, but I could talk to you for three hours and 15 minutes. We'll see how this goes. Oh, and before I get into the books, actually, one more book to talk about. We have a $1 book club. Uh, it is April 26th. It is a Wednesday night here at Bat City. We are, It's going to start at 8, and we are going to be discussing Hellcop Issue 1, 
from the image first. So this is actually volume three, issue one of Hell Cop. So you, um, which I've read before and I'm super excited to talk to people about it because I wanna see if everybody else comes in like as confused as I did because I didn't know there was a volume one and volume two, but then uh, ends up like me where by the end they're like, I still really know, feel like I know this character and I wanna see where it goes. So we're gonna be talking about that. It's $1 by the book, but it's free to come to book club. So if you already have the book or if you uh, don't want to read it, but you want to come hear other people talk about it, you're welcome to join us 8 o'clock on uh, Wednesday, April 26th. So I'm going to slide that over there. And now we're going to talk about comics that came out in the last two weeks. Don't ask me which week they came out in. It's just a surprise um, <laughs> because I, I don't remember specifically which weeks which. But we're going to launch off with Hexware Issue 5 from Image Comics. And this book, uh, it's Tim Seeley writing about monsters, which is not a surprise to anybody uh, who reads anything that Tim writes right now specifically. But this is all about a, a family who lives in a world that's kind of um, post-apocalyptic. They've, you know, they've got all the rich people live uh, above ground in these nice, fancy high-rise buildings, but there's kind of like nothing left on the street. And it's very classist specifically. And a family of, of elite people uh, end up having a bomb go off on their home and it ends up killing their daughter well, their android, their witchware house, house bot, uh, takes it upon herself to save the daughter. And so she learns witchcraft. So now she's a witch, witchware. And she learns witchcraft enough to bring the daughter back to life. And over the course of the last five issues, they have been sharing a body and trying to figure out who murdered the daughter and why they're trying to attack everybody in, in the whole entire world. And so she is working with a young boy who's always been really close to the family. And he's kind of the only one that knows the truth about what's going on. It's a great book. Um, I love the witchwear design. This is, I almost considered like this being my costume for Megacon. I almost decided to cosplay just so I could wear witchwear's outfit because it's so cute. Um, but the book is great and I cannot wait to see what's going to happen in issue six because I have a feeling issue six is going to be our our break point for a trade paperback. Um, and I'm really curious to see what exactly the cliffhanger is gonna be because every issue has had this really monumentous cliffhanger that makes you wanna go to the next issue. He's really mastering that right now. And so I wanna see how much you're, how big it's gotta be to top all those little mini cliffhangers that we've had at the end of every issue. Up next, we've got Nature's Labyrinth, issue five from Mad Cave. I made these books count uh, down today, so we've got all the, the later numbers at the beginning, and we'll work our way down to number one. But Nature's, yes, Nature's Labyrinth, number five. This is the story of a bunch of people who are essentially living through a Hunger Games kind of situation. They were all selected by some people we don't know who, and they were put into a labyrinth, and the labyrinth changes directions and obstacles, and there's this little uh, AI of a beaver or a cat or something that comes and speaks to them and tells them that the whole world's going to change again, and they the goal is to kill everybody but you, and you have to make it out alive, and the last person standing is going to win something, but we don't really know what they're going to get and how they're going to get it. But the interesting thing that we've just discovered is there is a family that is running this game and one of our contestants ended up underneath the maze somehow and now we are seeing what this family is up to and kind of figuring out how it's going to play into the situation and it gets crazy. Every issue of this takes it up a completely different notch and I'm like where's how where what do you have left like we're five issues in and I'm like where could we possibly go I feel like we've handled all of the things that we would need to handle in this labyrinth and yet we're still just building out to the world more and more every issue so um, we talk about it a lot I think that this new wave of mad cave books has been stellar over the last year. We've really seen a regrowth in what Mad Cave is, is putting out right now. And I think this is a great example. Plus you get some really hyper detailed art with all the labyrinth stuff, so it's super cool. Uh, highly recommend Nature's Labyrinth if you haven't started it yet. 
Um, we have Little Monsters issue 12 from Image Comics. I honestly, part of why I bring this every every time it comes out is I just want you to see like the really cool way that Dustin Nguyen is using his art style and the way they're using the black and white with little splashes of red in the art. But the other thing about this book is that we have a lot of vampire books on the shelf right now, but this one is kind of mixing a lot of that post-apocalyptic dystopian world with vampires. And now we've got a group of kids who are just on their own and they're trying to figure out their own way of living. And we've learned over the last, this arc really, what what started vampirism and how these kids came to be. But now they have interacted with their first human and we're gonna see that humans and vampires just struggle to coexist and that adults and children never really understand themselves, each other and uh, how hate can spread very quickly in any group of people. And I think it's such an interesting, we are definitely building to the end of this story. Uh, I think this will probably be our last story arc, and I want to see how everybody makes it out if they do. But Jeff Lemire is killing it on writing as usual and just kind of twisting that vampire story that's going on right now in a lot of books in a completely different way. Uh, next, Assassin's Apprentice, issue five from Dark Horse Comics. This to me is one of those sleeper books that I keep talking about and I am like, the, when it first started, I was like, I don't really know how I should talk about this book. And as it goes on and on, I get more invested in this book and I feel like people need to really start checking it out because we're five issues in and I love this story so much. Um, this is about a young boy who finds out that he is the son of the prince. But the prince had an affair with his mother, and now the prince has been outcasted from the town, but the boy has been accepted by the king. Because the king thinks if he raises this boy, then the boy won't be against him, he'll be for him. But the king wants to have him trained by the world's greatest assassin. And he is starting to learn those skills, but he also has to learn knight skills, and he has to learn how to work, and he has to learn how to kind of have this chivalrous moment. and. The thing about this boy is that he's not into killing and he's not into violence and he just kind of wants to use everything he's learning to help people. And so it makes for an interesting duality of him trying to be what the king wants him to be and be what his trainer wants him to be and just wanting to feel like he belongs somewhere and yet never being able to find that place because what he is and who he is are two very different things. Um, this is really great. I feel like people who, I, I have a lot of people come in all the time who ask me for Witcher comics and things that are kind of in that, that kind of realm where you could almost, it could be a video game. I feel like this is one of those where I could play this as a video game and make uh, the right or wrong choice with every movement because you see the boy actually think through and you get his emotions as you watch his face, which is really great testament to the art because I feel like a lot of time with uh, art, the facial expressions is one of the hardest things to convey. And in this book, we definitely can see him thinking and processing the information in the same way that we might want to do that too. Up next, Noctera, issue 13 from Image Comics. This is an ongoing Scott Snyder that had a quite a long break, I feel like, in there um, as he started working on a bunch of other things. But this is the story of... a world where the sun has been destroyed but the night and the darkness actually can turn you into these wraith-like monsters and now that's kind of adapting and so people have built little shelters that are all kind of built up on lights even though we don't have like they have to use generators and even when you travel between places you need to travel with a generator to keep your car lit and things like that and so we've been following a, a a, a set of siblings as they've worked their way through this world and they're trying to be the ones to bring light back to society and they've been working on it and of course at every turn something goes wrong but our first 12 our first 11 issues no first 10 issues I would say uh followed Val and now it is following um their sister or not their sister their sibling Val is a sister um, their sibling as they they work through and lead the way a little bit but this it, the book is crazy um, every there it's very action-packed but it's action driven by narrative and characters and so if you're looking for a new group of characters where you can kind of get your attachments to different people um, it's kind of 
like, but still get your almost sci-fi version of Fast and the Furious, um, where it's like, oh, we're all a family because we drive together, but with a really deep story, like, added into it, uh, it's not Tara for you. <laughs> sci-fi, Fast and Furious. There you go. Um, up next, Traveling to Mars, issue five from a Blaze Comics. Let's be honest, every time Mark Russell has a new issue out, I struggle with whether or not that is going to be a pick of the week because I just love Mark Russell's writing so much. Um, this is the fifth issue in this installment, which is really, um, we're getting to the point now where people are coming in, like, like freaking out, like, is the next issue in, is the next issue in, I need to know what happens next. And, um, rightfully so, because this is the story of, of a man who is living on earth and he gets a, you know, a type of cancer that can't be cured and corporations decide that they want to go and colonize Mars before anybody else. Because if you can do it even before the country does, then you can own, you can own Mars. And why wouldn't you want that? And so he is chosen because it's essentially a suicide mission to go and put the company's flag on Mars and claim it for them. And this is the story of him kind of in that that time frame of him traveling to Mars. And he's got these two robot buddies that he's traveling with, one of which has just su uh, suffered a major PTSD of being almost lost in space. We're seeing him interact with uh, people back home, not only the corporation, but with people who haven't ever had any compassion or connection with him before. And then now we find out, as we are moving into the end of this possibly series, possibly the, at least the first arc, that he's not the only one. Other corporations have decided to give it a go, and now he no longer gets to leisurely enjoy his trip to Mars, but he has to actually work for it and make sure that he doesn't fail again, as he feel he always has. And this is just another one of those great books where Mark Russell somehow makes every word that he says a philosophical discovery about who you are. And it's beautifully done. So if you haven't picked up Traveling to Mars, you're five issues in. Um, you could wait for the trade, but I think Mark Russell is one of those writers that we talk about where you need the time in between each issue to think about everything that you just learned. Um, there are a lot of books, you know, these, there are a lot of books where it's like, oh, I can trade weight and I can, I can read it all in one and it'll be great. And there are some books where you need that time frame to just digest it. And I think most things written by Mark Russell need that digestion period. I'm going to take a drink of this debonair wine. Um, because I yelled for three and a half hours at a Taylor Swift concert last night, so I need to have more drinks. Too. Mm. All right. That was delicious. That's really good wine. Very plummy. It is very plummy. And it's funny because it doesn't tell me what fruits it has in it, but I'm like, this is one that I feel like I, I guess you don't need to tell me because I can kind of taste them, but I'm curious if that's, that's what they're going for. Um, up next, we have Samurai Doggy issue five from Aftershock Comics. This is the story of that Ronin who has lost his family and is wanting to avenge them, except it is all done with dogs. So if you are a fan of Good Boy, this is actually more of a serious version of that um, because there's not all of the humor like you see in Source Points Good Boy. This is more of like the serious story of, of, of a bo boy who lost his family and is hunting them down. He just happens to be a dog. Um, and in, in, in the story so far, we've seen him make it to the town where all of the people say that his siblings may be. And he's fought all of the minions of all of the people trying to get to them. And now that he has discovered who is in charge of those minions specifically, it's definitely going to change the strategy uh, because the game has completely and totally just changed for him. And, uh, you know, it's one of those books that has these beautiful art pieces of him fighting and doing cool things as, as a dog. But there's um, there's just this, I can't, like, I need to know, like, what if he's going to be able to save his siblings. And he hasn't made, he hasn't progressed any further, really. He's still in this one spot in the town. And so I'm like, oh, man, this issue kind of finally gave us him 
getting forward with more information and seeing who else was an, involved. And it really just kind of shattered everything that we've worked towards so far. And so I want to see how we come back from that in issue six for sure. But Samurai Doggy, for those of you who are dog fans, you definitely need to add that to your collection. Um, up next, I Hate This Place, issue seven from Image Comics Skybound imprint. Uh, <laughs> Matt's giving me the eyes. This was last week, so uh, don't get mad at me for the fact that you didn't read it yet. <laughs> but um, I Hate This Place. If you have not read I Hate This Place, it is the story of a couple that inherits a ranch from one of the women's aunts. And they go to live on this ranch, and they think, how cool is this? We don't have to pay for this ranch. It's going to be fun. But it turns out everything on that ranch can kill you in so many different ways because you've got ghosts and aliens and big, giant woodland creatures and possibly, like, the devil in the woods kind of situation. And for the last arc, which has it, it is in trade format, so if you do want to catch up, the first five issues are in trade, you kind of deal with all of those creatures, and you still... Um, deal with monsters and all of that. But in this arc, we are learning once again that the biggest uh, uh, enemy and the most terrifying thing in the world are humans. And they have now been captured. I don't want to spoil that. So they have now, uh, the couple has been captured by um, the people that they least wanted to come in and mess things up. And I don't want to spoil that either. So just know that humans bad Monsters bad, humans worse. That's what you need to know. And then read uh, some hilarious Kyle Starks uh, anecdotes on the top of that, and you'll love it. So um, I ate this place. Always a good time. Definitely check it out. Uh, Help. Huh? Help. Yes. Uh, I know. I'm like, I don't want to. There's help spiders. I don't want to. Yeah, the help spiders. I kind of want to hug one, even though they're terrifying. They eat you. I know. They eat you, but they're kind of like... Cute. There are spiders that yell help. There are spiders that yell help, so you go out and look for them, and then they are giant spiders who have, like, got you into their lair by making you think there's, like, a child that needed help, which is what peacock, peacocks do. The little cry of a peacock is, like, a help, and I remember thinking that there was monsters in the woods when I would go to Girl Scout camp as a kid uh, because of it, and it turns out they were just peacocks, and people wonder why I don't like birds. Um, up next, Nemesis Relo Reloaded, issue four, uh, from Image Comics and Mark Millar as a part of his big return to comics, uh, and I feel like he didn't go anywhere, but his big return to his universe. Um, and specifically with relaunching uh, and rebooting Nemesis, and this is kind of a requel for the Nemesis series that he previously did. We are getting a backstory of a character who kind of is their version of, like, the Max Line Punisher. Like, he is somebody who is getting revenge on the entire city, and he is doing it in the most violent ways possible. And he, in issue one, he puts out, like, an attack, like, says, I own the city. Anybody who works with me, I will automatically add $10,000 to your bank account so that I can use you to do my bidding, essentially. And so he's got a vendetta, and he's got kind of a list of people that he's going after. But if everybody else in the city goes down at the same time, he's not going to be mad about it. Um, it is it is very Mark Millar, so there is a lot of violence, and you know, that, you know what you're getting into if you've ever read any of his books before, that this is going to be... Uh, it's going to be a heavy book, but if you are somebody who likes good action movies and good revenge stories, this is definitely going to be a book for you. Uh, this one kind of flies off the shelf of the the and is leading into whatever big game is going to be, which is the big event from Mark Millar coming this summer. So this was the launching point for that. So I would suggest if you're looking forward to that, picking up this one. Up next, ooh, we've made it to fours now, guys. We're gonna we're gonna count it down. Up next, we have Black Cloak issue four from Image Comics and Eisner Award winning Kelly Thompson. I just feel like we don't say Eisner Award winning Kelly Thompson enough for how cool she is. But this is for you Saga fans. And I'm gonna keep saying that because I know Saga fans are always looking for peop for something else they can read. Always tell me I love Saga. What else could I read that's going to compete with that? This is something that's in that same vein for you. This is the story of Phaedra, who is 
essentially a fairy and she works as a black cloak and black cloaks are the detectives in this fairy realm and at the very beginning of issue one we find out that the prince of one of the fairy um kingdoms has been murdered and she is investigating it and we also find out on that very first page that the reason she feels it necessary to be the one to investigate is because she was betrothed to marry that fairy for a very long time until she was exiled and over the course of the last four issues we've started to not only figure out what happened and as we're solving this investigation which we're still right in the heart of it but we also are starting to learn about phaedra and who who she is and where she comes from and why she was exiled and we really get a good bit bit of that in this as she tells us that story and uh, leading to some big cliffhangers at the end of this issue. But again, this is your your fantasy world that's got that little bit of politics, a little bit of sci-fi, a little bit of all those things mixed together, and then just being a completely character-driven narrative. This is, honestly, to me, this is some of Kelly Thompson's best work. I think she is killing it on every page of this book. So if you have not picked up Black Cloak, I highly recommend, especially if you are a Saga subscriber at a store. We have War Party, issue four from Rampart Press. This book is probably one of the fastest coming small press books I've seen. This one actually like makes it out on like every month on, on time. It's crazy, um, which I love to see. But this is the story of, um, it's during colonial America and it features um, a woman who is essentially a, a Native American goddess, and she has the ability to do it with skinwalking, and she has the ability to transform into an animal, um, use her spirit animal essentially as a way to to fight against people. And in this particular story, she has teamed up with some people who want to kind of take down a group of colonizers who are killing and stealing uh, children and killing women and stealing children from the people that live in this area. And so she has teamed up with them. And it's kind of going against her her people in a lot of ways and going against, but she's happy to see that other people are willing to stand up against the people in the area. And so it's it's a great story of these, these people all working together um, to just kind of take down the bad guys. This is classic, but set in colonial America. Um, if you like monsters and you love to see people get eaten by them and attacked by them because they did bad things you're gonna you're gonna really like this book i was actually really surprised like when i read issue one i was like wow that was actually a like more detail to the story than i thought it was gonna be and then they had the zero issue that went back and told me of all the folklore that goes with it and that's something that i would recommend if you're going to read this book i think the book is really good on its own but grab that zero issue and it's going to make it really really great because now i'm super into diani and i want to know more about this character um and i want to see her kind of appear in a ton more books because i think she's super great so if you didn't read the zero issue and you picked up an issue one and you were like i'm not sure if this is for me i highly recommend grabbing that zero issue um and and diving into it and learning how diani got her power and how all the the folklore that goes into it and the story beyond it because that that issue was the selling point for me on the whole series and also it's got like the super great uh glossy covers which i just absolutely love but check it out i know we've got a couple of people who have been loving that series so i i definitely think that it's it's a fun one for sure um up next hell to pay issue four from image comics and charles sewell this is one that had a little bit of a delay and we're not surprised that there was a little gap between three and four because we had this massive series called eight billion genies also going on from charles at the time um but this is the story of the shrouded college which is a a big universe that Charles Sewell is building out right now and the college basically recruits people by telling them that they can give them the future that they want and they will be perfectly fine they don't need to pay anything up front they just need to come in and learn the skills that they need to and then they will help them get the job of their dreams on the flip side and then they're in debt for the rest of their lives but those debts are actually owed to people who are having them do things like we're currently doing this, which is chasing down uh, cursed coins 
to ensure that all of the demons are under their control. And our couple at the very beginning of the first uh, issue had thought that they had accomplished finding all of them only to find out that it turned that there were in fact way more. And the college said, oh, well, you paid your debt, but now that we know that there's more, uh, looks like your debt is just compounded and now you have to work for all of that too. So give us another 10 years to the rest of your life because you have to uh, pay off your debt and we make up the terms and agreements as we want to. It's really great to hear Charles Soule's legal jargon come into play, but we are in this issue we find out that somebody that we've been trusting for the last couple issues isn't who we thought they were and we get a nice backstory that kind of helps us see not only who that character is but gives us a little bit more information about what we're dealing with and then it sets up completely where this is going i actually love what i love about this issue more than anything is it starts with somebody sitting in a chair and then you realize when you get to the end of the issue that essentially the entire thing was just like the long like villain monologue like this entire issue was just a villain monologue <laughs> and i think that that's hilarious and wonderful because we always talk about how they're so over the top and unnecessary in comic books and the fact that charles soul just wrote an entire issue that was a monologue uh, blows my mind and reminds us why Charles Sewell is fantastic as a writer. So keep it up, buddy. We're going to talk some more about him because 8 Billion Genies ended. All right. Speaking of Mark Millar, uh, we have Night Club issue four from Image Comics. Also part of this new uh, universe that Mark Millar is bringing out right now and what I love about this is that the tagline of this is like if you were a teenager who got bit by a vampire like what would you with the, what would you do with your powers and then the whole thing is that they want to get YouTube famous essentially and so in this series so far that's exactly what's happened we've had a couple of kids who got Bit, we had a kid who got bit by a vampire to save his life who was trying to recruit him into a society to do good things like a superhero and the kid was like nah dude I'm gonna go be YouTube famous look at all these stupid stunts I can do and then immediately bites his friends and gives his best friends powers and so then they all start doing stupid things and then they kind of think okay well we could save people and that would also get us YouTube views so they start doing that and the process of doing all that an actual emergency happens things go down and now these kids find themselves injured or captured or different things. And uh, by the end of this issue, we are definitely getting a big turn of they are not in control of their own reality anymore. So if you haven't checked it out, one of the best things about this is every issue is only $1.99. Uh, I don't know of any comic book on the shelf except for maybe some of the kids titles that are only $1.99. So this is super cool that we actually have a title you can check out for that cheap um and i recommend you do it's a lot of fun and it's again there's a lot of vampire books on the shelf right now but they all have their merit in different ways and i'm the wrong person to ask if there are too many vampire books because i love twilight so what do i know i like vampires uh, and if you argue in the comments that Twilight aren't real vampires, um, you're going to just be talking to yourself because I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to argue back. <laughs> Whatever you call something in your book is what it is because it's your mythology and your world. So come to a writing workshop and I'll explain that all to you. Um, up next, back to Fairy Tellia, issue four from Invader Comics. Oh my gosh. So this is one of those books that whenever it came out the first time, uh, Wednesday Phil was on the show with me and we both talked about how incredibly great that it was because it kind of has that I hate fairyland feel to it. And I am still sticking to that. If you are a fan of I hate fairyland and you have not read this, this is I hate fairyland, but in, but with Narnia. <laughs> um, essentially, this is the story of a group of kids who were uh, had an imaginary thought they had an imaginary world that they went to much like Narnia they kind of had their own escape point they all met in as children and one of the kids makes the mistake as a child and tells his parents about it and the parents think that they're crazy so all of the kids get separated they all move away from each other they're all forced to never hang out again and they all go to therapy and it fast forwards to them being adults and a little chipmunk he's a squirrel a little squirrel shows up and is like hey uh fairy tell ya 
is is getting destroyed. And they're like, whoa, fairy tale is real? We thought we made that up as children. And so all of them have been recruited to come back because they're the kings and queens of fairy tale. Yeah, there's your Narnia. Um, and they are the only people who can save it. But the problem is, is that none of them really believe in fairy tale anymore. And none of them know if this is real or if it's not. And also one of them is the president of the United States. So it's kind of a big deal that this squirrel just kidnapped him. But it's, We've just landed in fairy tale yet in this issue. You can see that the world is actually destroyed in this double page spread. And they are like, no, we're not going to be a part of it. We're going home. This is crazy. And um, we get a little bit of battle at the end that they don't want to be a part of. And bad things happen. And I might have screamed really loud and almost threw the comic across the room. So <laughs> um, if you want a book that is funny and also adventurous like... I hate Fairyland, but much like I hate Fairyland, we'll have moments where you'll want to throw it across the room because this funny uh, adventure that you aren't expecting to have emotions in suddenly makes you feel things. Then read back to Fairy Tell Ya because I was real, real upset with the ending of that issue. So good job, writers. Um, I'm still mad at you. Up next is Final Gamble issue three from Band of Bards. This is a, a new another new publisher. Also, I love that we just went from like three like three or four publishers in there that you might not have heard of. I love when that happens. Um, Band of Bards just launched in 2022 as a publisher, very much at the end. I'm super stoked to see what they're gonna bring us this year. But Final Gamble specifically is one of their flagship books, and it is about people who make terrible choices in their life and are trying to find their way out of it. So they sign up for a poker game. And if you win the poker game, you get everything you need to get out of debt and to get out of trouble. And they will give you that new identity. The problem is nobody's ever won the poker game. And that's on purpose because what they do is they use the poker game as a way to lure people in. And then they make them essentially take part in gladiator battles. If you are strong enough to be in the gladiator battles, you become a gladiator. If you're not the kind of person who's strong enough by their determination to be in the gladiator battles, you are stuck in the area where you can bet on the gladiator battles. The problem is you're betting your body parts. So if you lose, you lose. Um, and you literally lose because you lose a limb or an eye or your whole entire life. And the two people who were working together at the very beginning to play their game as a team in the poker match are now working together to try to get out of here by winning matches and getting to gamble away hopefully their success and not their death. Uh, this is really well done. Every time I read this book, I'm always just really excited. This is one of those that goes in my put it in the pile. I always make a separate pile of books that I'm like super stoked about and I have like I know I want to read so that when I get bogged down in tons and tons of books that I can like grab one of those and be like, okay, now I get like that moment I've been waiting for. This is one that goes in that pile every time. We're three issues in. Highly recommend you grab it. One of the things I love about Band of Bards is um, when they ship their books, they actually put protectors on them so that the glossy books don't get fingerprints on them until I bring them to you for this wind down your weekend. Um, but it's it's super great. Um, I love this publisher so far and I cannot wait to see what they're doing because all of their stories have been so solid so far. Up next, Monarch issue three. This is the new Rodney Barnes book from Image Comics. This is so if you're a fan of Philadelphia, this is this is that next in, uh, next book from Rodney Barnes. Not connected in any way. No vampires in it. We are actually dealing with an alien situation, um, and this follows a group of kids who were all living together in a house of like of orphaned children. It's a woman who takes in foster kids has raised all of these these children together. And one day they wake up and it's like Independence Day and there's just uh, UFOs kind of positioned everywhere around the, the town. And now we find out the connection one of these boys may have with the spaceships that are flying in. And we are learning as we go through the connections that he has with each of the people that he's been in his foster home with. It's a very beautifully built relationship driven story. Like every time I learn something else about the way these kids connect to each other, I, I just want to hug them or I want to see them like find each other and hug each other like through the moments. 
Um, but we're going to see some really interesting storytelling coming into play with how these aliens are coming. I cannot show you anything in the second half of this book because everything's a spoiler. Um, how these aliens are going to come into play. And once again, even though we're just dealing with children, much like little monsters, you still find out that people are the biggest monster. And so we've got some really like some kids who are like, hey, if it's the end of the world, I'm I'm gonna do what I want. And it's it's crazy. This is such a good book. And I'm super stoked. I know that um, Philadelphia has been one of those that's consistently nominated for things. We know that Rodney Barnes is somebody who brings us great books every time. So if you haven't jumped in, you're only three issues. And now's the time because we're getting to that big turn of things that you need to check out. And so up next, we've got Nightfall Double Feature Issue 3 from Vault Comics. Oh my gosh. And two, two separate stories in here. This is a double feature because you do get two stories. The first one is written by autumnal writer Daniel Krauss, and it is the story of this the world is now suddenly finding bones and everything except for dead bodies. Like all of the bones in the bodies buried around the world are just popping up in different places. And a member of the government who like a government scientist and a priest have been working together to kind of figure out what is going on. And we have figured out what is going on, but we have not figured out how to stop it. Uh, Daniel Krauss is a master class in horror writing every time he does anything. And this is another example of that. If this is every time you're turning the page going, oh my God, I cannot possibly imagine what could happen on the next page. And you're right, you won't because it's going to be different than what you expect and things get crazy. And I'm not going to show you the end of that book because that story specifically gets real crazy and this is kind of the one where we see what that means. Um, the backstory is all about a family who uh, is is a blended family. They're on their first trip where they're trying to come together, um, a dad and his son and a mother and her children. And it's got it's a masterfully beautiful art by Chris Sheehan on it. They are wonderful. We love them. But this family has stopped at a motel for the night and the mom and one of the kids end up going into this RV and in the RV something crazy comes for them and kind of changes everything about who they are and the people in the motel seem to know that this thing is there and that something is happening because they're like you're not going to make it through the night if you're not like prepared for it to the the future stepdad and he's like I don't care about me making it through the night I just want to save my children and my and my my soon-to-be wife and they're like okay like you might make it but you have to go through all of this stuff and we're setting up what all that stuff is going to be and honestly like it's so cool and I just really want to look at Chris Sheehan's art so I'm just talking at this point now to show you more of Chris's art because I love Chris um, but it's such a good book. If you if you like classic horror and really, really well done stories, you should be picking up Nightfall Double Feature. It's um it's one of those books where you actually do get two full stories in it. It's not like miniature versions of stories. They're not like four page, eight page stories. They're each could have been their own issues. So this is a actual full like double issue um that you're getting and you're gonna love it. So Grab, grab it. Just read it and love it. Get Are the stories a continuation from the previous yes. issue? Yes. They're not so standalone They're not stories. standalone stories. You've got Daniel's story is going to go until the end. And then Chris's story is going to go until the end. So, uh, But if you are a Bat Fam member, you've probably been um, handed a copy of The Autumnal and fallen in love with it. And so I always like to mention that this is that team split in half with new new team members put with them to kind of give uh, some opportunity for us to see them work with other people but still kind of blend together in a book, which I love. And ongoing. And ongoing, yes. Um, much like, not like Creep Show where it was individual stories that changed, but like Shock Shop where the stories continued. You got two stories, but they continued for the whole thing. All right. Up uh, next, we've got Space Job Issue 3 from Dark Horse Comics. This is The Office in Space. 
I could literally leave that right there and that would be enough to tell you everything about this book. But um, basically, you've got your Michael Scott kind of character who becomes the captain of a spacecraft accidentally and is absolutely terrible at, at his job. And he is trying to avoid doing that job by continuously pushing off the assignments that people give him and saying he has to carry this cargo to a new place and won't even give up his cargo because he just does not want to go to the new assignment, which is war. His team is made up of ridiculous people who all do the confessional videos, much like The Office, which I love seeing them draw that in panels. And you've got the science officer, who, the, like the medic, who her husband is has been possessed by an alien and she's trying to figure out why her husband doesn't seem to love her anymore. And the alien is like, I'm just trying to do research to see how long it'll take this woman to realize that she's being treated badly and move on. Like, humans will take anything. And uh, the first mate of the ship, that's not what they're called in space, but the whatever that is, um, was died on his first five seconds on the job and he had an assistant which is a new thing and they uh just randomly got promoted in this issue so we've got some bitterness and some craziness and honestly 100 percent, if you just like the office you need to be reading this book because it's it's the office set in space it's kind of i guess they did that with space force if they would have actually ever been in space and gotten off the ground this is essentially steve carell's team in Space Force, uh, working actually in space. Um, up next, Barbaric, Hell to Pay, issue three. This is volume three, issue three of Barbaric, essentially, uh, from Vault Comics. And this is the story of a man who is a barbarian named Owen, and he is cursed to only be able to help the people who are actually, only be able to kill people who did something wrong and has to help people who are in need. And his curse comes with the talking ax that gets drunk on blood. Right now though, Owen is actually in hell, trying to work his way back out by killing the bad people that put him there um, and dealing with his curse. And on earth is his necromancing partner, uh, Soren, who is actually working with ax the bloodthirsty ax himself. And they are trying to figure out how to get to hell so that they can help Owen and her and her team that is continuing to grow over the last couple of volumes are working their way closer and closer. And this is, it's just pure havoc in every issue. You've got a lot of, a lot of slaying both of people and of humor in these books. They're quite hilarious. Um, I love that the further into the story we get, the more story we actually get though. Like it started out kind of just, oh, we're gonna like hack and slash and tell some jokes. And now we have this really big story. We're starting to see people from Soren's past show up. We're starting to connect who Owen is. Owen is learning that like you can't necessarily be cursed unless you want to because you control your own destiny if you don't believe in the gods. So like how did he get cursed if he doesn't believe in things? So lots of great conversations happening in this uh, most ridiculously wonderful book. Radiant Pink, issue four. I messed up. That was issue four. Um, from Image Comics and our massive verse and uh, Emma Kubert on art, who I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a minute. But if you are a fan of the Radiant Black universe, this is another uh Installment to the Massive Verse, as always, your little footnote, you don't have to read everything in the Massive Verse to enjoy any of the titles. I have people who are only subscribed to Radiant Pink and have never even heard of Radiant Black. So you can do what whatever you want to do. But this is the story of a girl who is able to teleport to different places and she's got some superpowers and she's trying to save some people at a hospital from something bad that is happening and she ends up teleporting herself and another girl to another world and now she can't get back and over the last couple of issues I can't show that page over the last couple of issues um they have been dealing with the cat alien that they saved and the cat alien has brought them to a his planet which is wonderful. If you're a cat lover, you're going to love all the little cat jokes that are on there. But they are 
I think that they are there to get some help and it does not work out the way that they want it to. And meanwhile, back home, her family is trying to figure out how to get Radiant Pink back home in whatever way they can. We only have one more issue, so hopefully she makes it. Um, but I absolutely love uh, Emma Hubert's art and I love how fun and uh this is very, it's very young adult in its look, um, which Emma Cuber is really good at. But I would definitely say it's a little more new adult in some of the, the capacities. So that like 20s age, of, which is how old the characters are. And they're like 20s. Age. Hmm? I did. It's not really like that crazy or anything on the page. But I, I know that like that's a variable for people. So that's why I'm like, it's not a kid's book. But um, there is like a couple having a moment. So... Um, up next, issue three of Mosley from Boom Studios. This is the story of, of a man who ends up deciding that he's going to take a job with the government to help train AI so that they can create androids. And years later, they have in fact created these androids and now they are the gods of our society and they've taken over and we uh, don't have any say so in anything anymore. And he is trying to convince his family that, like his daughter specifically, that that's a terrible idea because she has gone to work for these android gods and she can, he can't get her out of it. And one night when he's walking home, he gets a magic hammer and is told he is the one that has the power to destroy all of these robot gods that have taken over. And so now he is in an epic quest to destroy all of the androids and it's fantastic i i just love i love this like old man like taking down technology um it's the ultimate like get off my lawn moment in a lot of the issues and i i love that so much but now we've just learned um about a secret society that's been kind of working uh against them the, like against the robots and stuff the whole time and so he's trying to see if he can team up with them um which i love because you get that conversation of oh we're just kind of like talking about it we didn't want to do anything about it um which i love seeing that up next breath of shadows issue three from idw from their originals imprint which if you know this show you know that i'm a big fan of pretty much everything on the idw originals imprint and this is the story of a rock star who has a severe drug addiction and he is trying to find his way out of that so that his band can stay together and so that he can get clean except not really because what he did was he found a book about a, a guy who found a secret spring essentially in a remote place and that he was like oh if you come here and you take stuff from this spring area you'll never need drugs again because you'll have like the ultimate high forever and so he's trying to find that and um you know that never goes well he's his whole band has now shown up they're all working their way through this jungle they've got researchers with them they've got tour guides uh, everything that can go wrong is going wrong but also if I didn't mention this is a horror book so <laughs> You've been thinking that we think the whole time that these little bug creature things are in his head. I still don't know if they are or not. Like, when he sees his drug addiction, it kind of looks like those crazy bugs. But I'm starting to wonder more and more every issue if everybody else can see them too. Um, I don't know. It makes me feel like I'm on drugs because you don't really know, like, what's real and what's fake. Um, and it's terrifying. And uh, I don't know how it's going to wrap up. I don't know if the next issue... No, we are uh, this is issue three, so we probably still have two more issues because most of the uh, IDW originals have been about five issues. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but if these bugs are real, I'm, I'm kind of... I might be more terrified than if they're just hallucinations. Um, up next, we've got Trident of Aurelia issue three from Battle Quest Comics. Um, this is a fantastic mermaid story, which I don't think we have enough of. Um, this is a story of a young girl who lives with her dad, who is killed before issue one even starts. And she is thrown in jail for trying to read books. And as she uh, breaks out and tries to, or I uh, know she does not break out, sorry. As she is about to be sacrificed for being irresponsible and breaking the rules, she lands in the ocean and is given the powers of the mermaids for reasons that I won't tell you. 
And now she is working with the mermaids to kind of figure out a way to break this darkness that has encircled not only uh, the the ocean, but the people sur people surrounded by it, which may in fact save her her Earthside village, but will definitely save the oceans. And it's such a it's such a great story to see these connection points, to see the characters. Honestly, my only complaint is that I wish that there was more of it. Um, because it is only a four-part series, so I feel like they're rushing through some parts of it, and I, I want them to just... I wish this was an, a long, ongoing series because I want this world to just keep getting bigger and bigger, and they're doing that in every single issue, but I'm like, oh my god, I want even more. I'm just greedy, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, I just... I We don't have mermaid books. There's not a lot of mermaid comics. There's not a lot of mermaid... Uh, anything and this one is so like the world is so cool that I just want to dive in a little bit more uh, but if you haven't read Trident of Aurelia you should because it's fantastic and the art like those colors who is the colorist on this um, I have to go back two seconds uh, the colorist is Venetia Charles and fantastic job like, like the, this is so bright and also we talk about all the time I'm gonna show this again uh, we talk about people and how fat like with fast coloring and digital coloring we we oftentimes get these backgrounds that don't have anything in it but I love that even when we have and I think it's like right here even when it's like oh it's a blue background like that looks like moving water in that blue background like you mixed your blues and greens and gave it a ripple effect that it actually looks like those people are underwater or in one of those rooms at an aquarium where they paint it to look like you're underwater at least. And I think that's fantastic. So great job to the colorist for the work on this book um, and obviously to the whole team because I think it's so great. But yeah. Um, up next, Where Monsters Lie, issue three from Dark Horse Comics. And this is what happens to all of the serial killers and monster type characters from horror movies when it's not their turn, uh, when they're not, when they're not out killing people and they're not out, um, being, being the current serial killer, what do they do? And the thing is, is that they all live in a nice residential community, uh, with a nice HOA run by a little old lady who is kind of like a Norma Bates or Jason's mom or something. Um, and in the first issue, we see a guy that lives in the community breaking rule number one, which is he brings kids home to experience one of his torture traps. And one of the kids gets away, and now the cops are coming for all of the monsters, and the monsters have to defend themselves. And that's where we are. We're just in pure mayhem and madness as the monsters defend themselves. And it's Kyle Stark, so it's hilarious and you just need to read it. Like, that's all I have to tell you. It's just monsters wreaking havoc. Uh, I know it's just because my hair is tickling it. Um, Stray Sheep number three from Blood Moon Comics. This is the story about a guy who loses everything in the most tragic issue one I've ever read in a single comic. Um, she won was like a trigger warning for all things. And, but he decides in issue two that he's going to take up an offer to join a secret society that is playing a game where the stakes are your life. And you never know what the game's going to be. You show up, you put on a mask, you don't talk to anybody, you just follow whatever rules they give you. And he decides he's going to, he's just going to go for it. Because, like, what else? And if you win, you get money. And if you, like, at the very end. Uh, but until then, you just keep playing with your life. And he is slowly breaking rules in different ways because he is building connections with people but in this particular issue a person that he knows from work is is there as well and breaks all of the rules and we see how serious they take the rules and yet he is slowly uh, mixing up some of the rules and breaking them a little bit bending them I guess you could say um to see how far he can get away with it crazy crazy book if you like really dark storytelling um and like people who are willing to put it all online and like oh my gosh like that person just like died <laughs> like I just met this character and now they're dead 
you're gonna love this book because you don't know you honestly like don't know what's gonna happen on the next like in any issue because every issue is filled with a game that's completely different so we don't know what we're going into when we get the issues um up next blood tree issue three from image comics and peter tomasi which it's been a minute since we've talked about a tomasi book that like wasn't about superheroes so i do love that we have this as an option right now um, it's labeled Teen Plus. We really got to work on what we label comic books. Guys, this is definitely a mature title. Um, this is the story of a detective and the murder mystery that he is trying to solve. And that murder mystery is that a man is killing people and sewing angel wings onto them and putting them in different angel poses around the city and he's, they're actual feathers, like he's pulling feathers off of birds and like getting feathers off the ground and then like building real full size angel wings on these people. And it's a great, it's a great story. Uh, I mean, Peter Sponsi wrote Detective Comics for forever, so the man knows how to write a detective story. And in this particular issue, we're finally starting to see some of the clues come together and see how this detective is moving it along and kind of learning a little bit of the backstory on our own plus with the detective of who our serial killer might be and why they're doing what they're doing and like it it has kind of like a Dexter feel if you think about um like the 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 episodes that had like the Trinity killer and how detailed that went into um, him kind of stalking that but if you are into that level like that's what I'm saying like that level of murder um, and that level of, of storytelling for hunting down the person you're after you're really gonna like this but honestly if you've ever read anything Tomasi this is <laughs> it it does not have any of the Tomasi hope that you usually feel but it does have all of his great writing skills in it um, so I highly recommend that that book I'm gonna take a drink for a second and uh, just while I'm drinking, you can know that I'm drinking Debonair, which is a cab sab from California. It's so smooth. I'm going to refill this now so I don't have to do it when I get to the end of the glass. So that I can put it over there. Okay. We got a couple more before we get to our endings and beginnings. Um, Almighty Issue 3. I'm in Issue 3. I don't know why I just looked at that like I didn't know. Um, Almighty Issue 3 from Image Comics. This is the story of a, a girl who was kidnapped and the essentially the assassin that comes to save her. And the very first issue we see this assassin show up and you think it's going to be a story of her like breaking them out but in reality this is going to be their story of their adventure of them trying to get back to the girl's home or somewhere else and uh Faye our assassin and the girl that she is transporting are now on their way into zone one which is the curse zone that you're not supposed to talk about and you're not supposed to go in and nothing good could can kind of exist in there and they think that the only way to get through and get to safety is to kind of go into that and i have been waiting for that so i can't wait for issue four because they have been hinting about zone one since the very first issue and how dangerous and dark it is and how there's you know like nobody knows what dwells within kind of thing so I can't wait to see what's in there uh but this is a really fun book with some really great characters and you should just honestly check it out and, and then come talk to me after the next issue when I'm excited about zone one um how I became a shoplifter issue three from Sumerian comics this this book is just great um it's hilarious because I feel like the the kids in it are are pretty close to my age as and it's kind of just vignettes of their life so it's it's great to see like oh when they were teenagers in the 90s and it's like oh me too I, I recognize all of these feelings and so uh this one I like it because it's called side b and it's all about uh the brother of our main character for a lot of it and so in this first part we do see um our main character and his therapy session kind of talking about 
some of the crazy, he's like, oh my God, I had the craziest dream the other day and I was like this and this happened and I became a superhero and I had to save my family. And the therapist is like, oh man, so you're having crazy dreams. What do you think it means? And he's like, I don't know, maybe this and this. And he has this whole moment of evaluation and then like the brother comes in and they're like, okay, so what do you have to say for your therapy session? He's like, oh, I feel really bad because I gave my brother acid this week. Uh, and I think he was really tripping hard and I love it cause it's like, oh, ha ha, that makes sense. Like why they did that. And then, uh, the second story is about the brother and his experience with a honey, I shrunk the kids, kids kind of moment where him and his best friend end up going into a comic book world because they learn that if they go into the world and come back out, uh, anything they make can become ginormous. And so their goal is to take a uh, some weed in there and see if they can come back with a lifetime supply of it essentially uh, and the adventure that they go on so completely ridiculous uh and completely hilarious at all times so if you're just looking for something that's like that raunchy adult humor but well done honestly how, how i became a shoplifter is great for that um all right, we made it to number two, so yay. Uh, Kitsune, number two from Scout Comics. We uh, had a samurai doggy earlier, and now we're gonna have a samurai fox. Uh, and this is the story of, of a samurai fox, essentially, and his partner, who I believe is a chicken. He's a bird of some sort. Um, and their, their journeys across the world, and they are trying to just kind of make it as samurai, like independent ronins, I guess I should say. They're not samurai, they're independent ronins. And they are working on their own mission and everywhere they go, things just do not go well for them. And people are kind of waiting for them at all times. Uh, the fox in the story is blind, so he it re relies on his instincts really well and it's it's great dynamic. Um, honestly, they kind of remind me of the, the duo in Rogue One that where the two like Jedi, rogue Jedi kind of people that were on their own, they kind of have that same similar feeling, but with animals. Um, really great. We're starting to see how it's going to come into play where uh, who they are and where they come from. We just learned our, in this issue, we learn our Fox's backstory about how he was exiled from his community to become a Ronin. So we get a little bit of that information, but just enough to get us into our cliffhanger for issue two on who might be coming for them and what's going to happen. So honestly, if you like Ronin books and you like samurai, I think this, uh, and you like animals, I think this is a, a great story for all of those things for sure. The gimmick issue two from Ahoy Comics. This is a, a new wrestling adjacent kind of book. Um, it starts out with a wrestler who, in issue one, who is in a match and he ends up losing it and he actually like punches a hole in the guy's head because apparently he has superpowers <laughs> and now he's on the run and he's currently hiding in another, uh, in Mexico working as a luchador. But we find out in this issue that him and his partner who like, uh, were a couple, like his partner in his couple, um, were both wrestlers and we get their backstory of how they met and everything, but we find out that they do have a child and that child also has superpowers and he has no idea that he even has this child. And we get to see information about like his family and his parents and what they're going through. And it's, it's just, um, it's just a classic Ahoy story. Like, you take everything that's going on in other comic, comics and you do the almost parody, like, the satire of it um, while also making a good point. And we get a lot of those, like, satirical moments in here, but we also, as usual with Ahoy, just get a really good story. Um, so if you are fans of wrestling, this one has the least amount of wrestling in it for a wrestling book, but it does reference the concept of it um and I, I think you should check it out like i love that it's like the gimmick what is your wrestling gimmick uh is essentially what we're talking about here um up next clear from our issue two from dark horse and scott snyder's comicsology originals so this is one of those where you're going to get two two issues in one 
uh, because they are printing those comicsology stories from Scott Snyder into books. So you may have already read this if you have. Here's a great chance to get a, a print copy of it. But I love Clear. Clear is the story of, of a man who lives in a world where we now can put veils on our eyes. And you can see whatever you want. If you want to see the world as a zombie apocalypse, you can see the world as a zombie apocalypse. If you want to see it as the new Barbie movie, you could see the whole world where everybody looked like they were in that. Uh, and our main character chooses not to see any of those things. He is one of the few people that doesn't veil his his vision. And we, in the first issue, we learn that he is working, he works as a private eye, which is why he partially why he doesn't veil his, himself because he wants to be able to see what other people are missing. And we also learn in issue one that his ex wife um, is killed, died. We don't really know. He's trying to figure it out. He doesn't believe that she. She died. He thinks that somebody killed her. And so we have gone on this investigation with him and we're putting all these clues together and kind of figuring out what she was up to. We also learned his backstory in this issue. So I love that because we get to see who he was before the fall of society and before Veils kind of took over so much. Um, I mean, honestly, if you've ever read anything Scott Snyder, you know that he's a fantastic writer. And this is no exception. And you get uh, Francis Manipal on art, which I know everybody was really stoked about seeing those two work together on an indie book. Um, it's so good. I I can't recommend it enough. Scott Snyder uh, is rocking it with this one for sure. And the mystery and where we go with it in this issue, like it's so hard to talk about this book because you do get two issues in one and the mystery like moves so fast and everything is like little tiny pieces like he's so good at breadcrumbs um you can see you know how court of owls and everything like works so well through um through that batman run because he's scott snyder is just such a good breadcrumb dropper and everything and it's a spoiler so just read it we're only on issue two of clear so grab it um, up next, Maniac of New York, don't call it a comeback, issue two from Aftershock Comics. Um, Jason, not named Jason, the Maniac of New York, uh, Maniac Harry, as he is known in the series, um, did in fact take New York in volume one of Maniac of New York. Um, and so if you are a fan of Friday the 13th, you definitely need to be checking this out. We had uh, two volumes of this already. They are in trade paperback. But we thought that we destroyed the maniac at the end of, well, every volume because it's a Friday the 13th book. Um, but we thought we destroyed the maniac for good at the end of volume two. And now there is a new maniac, Maniac Mary, as they're calling her. And uh, everybody's kind of on her side. Like... There's, there's no, no, nobody wants her taken out. Nobody wants to see the police stop her. Everybody kind of wants to see her do what she's doing and keep going. And, but that's not the way this works. So uh, we're going to see how this turns because every, every issue, like we get the people like kind of coming into it and uh, from our past couple issues and our, our volumes and we start to see how there's more to it and we're getting a legend. So for those of you who likes the Halloween later movies where there was lore and there was a reason that Michael Myers uh, was going after people and was crazy. We might be getting a similar situation in the way that we're handling Maniac uh, Harry and the people that are reacting in such capacity. So just know if you are a fan of The Curse of Michael Myers, you might be getting a little bit of that kind of lore in this world and yes i'm literally just selling the book to matt right now if you guys don't know <laughs> i'm like i'm literally just trying to tell matt what it's about without spoiling it for him um, up next also mark millar uh and that big universe is we have the ambassadors issue two from image comics this is all about a woman who um is in jail and is a world-renowned scientist uh who figures out how to create superheroes and offers to create a team of superheroes for the world. And she's going to choose six people from around the world to represent different countries. And they are all going to be given superpowers. And they are going to work as ambassadors and keep our world safe. 
Uh, she gets to make all the decisions. She gets to give everybody their powers, their costumes, everything. Um, also, some crazy stuff happened in issue one with that woman, and I don't want to spoil any of it. But we get our first glimpse of a different hero that she has created in, in this issue and kind of see what his powers look like and why, how she makes the choices that she makes. And I'm really in for what she's doing. And honestly, of the new Mark Millar books and building out this universe so far uh, we're two issues in on this one and I can already say this one's my favorite because I do like the conversation of everybody arguing like oh well I have enough money to pay you so you should make me a superhero or oh I've done like trying to give their resume as reasons why they should be heroes and her just looking at all of that and being like none of these people deserve it but like this person who tried to save like a dog on the side of the road is a better candidate because he wasn't looking for fame or fortune. He was just looking to actually be decent. And I love that conversation as like how we determine who should be a superhero. And yet also having the conversation of like everybody's obsessed with superheroes. And they don't even understand what a superhero is supposed to be. They like even say that in here. Like we have this obsession with superheroes in this world. But like nobody's actually doing any of the good that the superheroes were talking about. And I was like oh thank you. Like yes let's have this conversation Mark Millar. Uh, and they're like oh well that's just because you know certain companies have really great marketing and not because of people trying to be good and oh, so good I'm so in ambassadors number two can't wait to see where it goes I'm gonna take a drink of debonair really fast oh my gosh so good so good okay up next phantom road issue two from image comics and jeff lemire um, I love when we are on a week where there's 27,000 Jeff Lemire books because they're all so good. Um, and this one is the story of a guy who is driving a, a, a rig. He's a semi-truck driver. He's driving across the world. And in issue one, he sees a woman who's kind of stranded on the side of the road, thinks he's going to be helpful, and somehow the two of them end up in... An alternate dimension? I'm putting question marks on there. Um, they end up in an alternate version of reality where there's all these zombie-esque creatures. I say they look like the the creatures from um, I Am Legend. But in that, they have no idea how they got there. They have no idea why they connected on paths. They have no idea what's going on at all. And neither do you because you're just following their journey. Well, issue two opens up and we finally get a little bit of answers and a lot more questions. And we find out that these two have no choice but to go on this adventure. And I kind of love that because you always wonder, you always read these stories or watch movies and you're like, why don't they just leave? Like, why are you doing the thing? Like, you could just have gone. Like, I don't understand. And in this book, they actually try that moment of like, I'm just going to walk away and you figure out that you can't. And I love when writers give the characters no out and they have to go through the act of discovery and the obstacles placed in front of them. And I still can't tell you everything. The things I do know are giant spoilers and the things I don't know, I don't know. So just read Phantom Road and figure it out for yourself and have a conversation with me about all of your theories and thoughts uh, after you get to issue two because it's it's going to be fun to figure it out together. Up next, Stoneheart issue two from Image Comics and Emma Kubert. Uh, I love Emma Kubert so much, and I got to tell her that I loved her when I was at Megacon, like her art when I was at Megacon, how much I just think she's doing incredible work. And I think that we don't talk about Emma enough. I think we talk about all the other Kuberts and we don't talk about Emma. So I'm going to just keep talking about how great Emma is forever. But Stoneheart is the story of a young girl who is essentially like the strongest paladin in this world of, of this fantasy world. But she's got a really big problem where she doesn't follow authority and she thinks that all of the authority is not to be listened to. And so they're over it, and they wipe her mind, and they send her to live in this village. And she has no idea who she is, but she's like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to, like, come learn how to be a blacksmith. This is great. And at the end of issue one, something happens to her trainer, and something happens, and she is discovered as possibly being somebody who has magical powers. But the problem is she doesn't remember any of that happened. 
at the of everything that happened at the end of issue one, she doesn't remember. So in issue two, she has met this guy who just tells her that he's there to be her new trainer and to like be her caretaker. And she's like, I don't know who you are. And he's like, yeah, but you don't know anything. So how is this wrong? And we're getting a really great connection between these two. Um, it's going to be so much fun. I love, I love, love, love this main character because uh, she has kind of that same attitude that Yada Floor has that she's like, I'm really good at whatever it is I'm supposed to be really good at, but like doesn't have any idea who she is or what that is. Uh, I love her personality. I love her the way she makes friends with characters in this book. I love the art. I love the story. If you're not reading Stoneheart, honestly, you need to. Uh, it's just fantastic. And and everything Emma does is just like that people come back to me. Like I still have people coming back and asking for ink blot and people come back forever. Like, Oh my God, I missed that Emma Kubert book. And now I want to get it. And it's like, well, now you can't find the single issue. So let me just save you the time and tell you that we're only on issue two of Stoneheart right now. So now's the time to grab it. Don't miss it. Uh, because you're going to come back six months from now and ask me if I have it. And I'm like, no, because everybody else jumped on it and you missed it. So jump on it. Uh, I once again want to sing songs when I say these things. Then I remember I only have like 10 seconds of a song before I get sued. So we're not going to do that. Um, all right. So we've got some books ending at least their arcs. I'm going to see if this is. Yeah, this is the end of the end. Okay. Ending. I think all of them are actually ends of ends. So um, this is issue six of Flawed from Image Comics. This is the story of a woman who is a therapist. And she learns, she uses her therapy sessions to learn about people that are hurting her clients. And then she goes after them. And the whole time in this series, she has been chasing after a man who basically takes the skin off of his victims. And we learn that there is a whole big underground society that's kind of running this town that's going into some crazy like demonology and she is somehow connected enough to it but she pulls in a group of people to work with her to kind of take them all down and she's just awesome and I just like watching her fight and once again uh let's just call this the end of volume one I'm going to see if there's a letter at the end that says yeah into the first arc Huzzah! Yay! Because I just want to see this go on and on forever. I love this character. I want to see her fight everybody because she's awesome. So, yay! There is a letter from the writer at the back. This is the end of the first arc. I can't wait. Let's grab arc two immediately. Um, completely wrapping up is uh, 8 Billion Genies with issue 8 of 8 from Image Comics and Charles Sewell. Um, and I think, is it Ryan... Ryan Brown, yeah, Ryan Brown, who did curse words with him. So this is your curse words team back together again, bringing you one of the biggest books of last year. Um, and finally, an ending. This is the story of everybody on Earth uh, gets a genie when the population reached is 8 billion. Everybody on Earth gets a genie. They get one wish. And we've kind of seen how that played out and that this is a, a cycle of situation and that we're going to see how these how humanity always destroys and rebuilds itself um, when given the opportunity. I don't want to tell you too much, but I do want to tell you that if you haven't read this book, if you can find the issues and go get the issues right now, great. If not, put in an order wherever your local comic shop is right now for the trade paperback because everybody should read this book. Uh, it's so good. You get people who choose to be superheroes. You get people who get, choose to protect other people. You get people who choose to hoard wishes. You get people who just want to protect their friends group. Um, you follow people for literally hundreds of years, thousands of years as they go through the situation. And everything that happened in this final issue was like, you finally actually learned what was going on and what the point was when you get to this final issue. And it was, it was so incredible, uh, to go on this journey. And I'm, I'm, I'm like thankful to Charles Soule for allowing us to be on this journey with him because it was so good. And, uh, I, and I remember when I got to the end of the issue, I, I looked at Matt who had just read it as well. And I was like, man, that was just kind of beautiful. It was just 
the ending of that was just beautiful. And I, I'm so glad that I went on that journey and I think everybody else should. And I think that again, if you didn't read it in single issue format, see if you can find them. It's going to, you're not getting first prints of number one, just don't, don't try. Um, but if you can find additional prints, check it out. Um, and if not, like I said, order your trade now because you're going to want it. Also wrapping up this week is White Savior with issue four of four from Dark Horse Comics. And I always preface this with the fact that this title is as ridiculous as you should take it. This is a satire in the truest sense of the word, a parody of um, The Last Samurai. Nobody in this book believes that you need a white savior for anything. So know that going into it. This is the story of a teenage boy who his grandfather is always telling him about the white savior that saved his village in feudal Japan and they are and their ancestors and how they dealt with that. And he thinks it's ridiculous as we all do that somebody that the feudal Japan Japanese uh, tribe would need a white savior to come in and save them. And then the young boy somehow gets sucked back in time with the girl who steals his wallet from uh, him trying to save her. And now they are the people who are in that village that are going to be killed unless they have the white savior save them, except for the fact that the white savior they accidentally kill. And they weakened at Bernie's the entire situation, trying to get through this historic moment and also make it out alive. This is one of the most hilarious comic books on the shelf right now. You absolutely should read it. If you are a fan of The Last uh, Samurai, you might not want to read it because it does make fun of that movie and it, and ev at every turn. But if you are somebody who watched that movie and also realizes how ridiculous it is that we keep making movies about Japanese culture where a white person comes to save them, then you definitely need to read this book because uh, it's fantastic and again hilarious. Um, I think I think everybody should read it. But um, up next we've got Two Graves issue six. Off, uh, from Image Comics. This is the story of a young girl who is trying to bury her mother, put her mother's ashes into the ocean, but she is traveling along with a Grim Reaper, and over the course of time, she actually finds out that she is becoming one, and she has a certain level of power that connects her to the act of death, and she is kind of learning how to, to take his place possibly, or at least take the place of someone in the Grim Reaper world. And we kind of learn that um, death comes for everyone, but it comes in different ways, is essentially the whole purpose of the book. And there's some really great moments in here as she kind of comes to terms with that herself. So if you didn't read it, it is wrapped up right now, but it is a, just the journey to journey to your own death and dealing with your grief, honestly, is what this book kind of walks you through. Um, so if you are somebody who's experienced that, it's a great way to look at it. Um, Koshi and Hell, issue 404 from Dark Horse Comics, and this is part of your Hellboy universe. I say it every time I bring it up, but um, I've never read most uh, any of Hellboy, but I read all of these side stories and I completely fall in love with all of them without the knowledge of the Hellboy world. So if you uh, haven't read Hellboy, you are not going to be lost at all. Uh, but Koshi is someone who is the undead. He's supposed to not be able to die no matter what. And now he is in hell and he's kind of trying to work his way back out of that, whether that is to live again or to, to find a a safer place to be something and he's worked his way through with some demons and now he's actually working his way through his personal demons they show him his ghost of all the people he may have harmed whether physically or emotionally as he does even see like his his wife and who he wasn't there for and he kind of has to deal with all of that to gain a heart uh from from someone and then work his way back through the situation. Um, this had a beautiful ending. Uh, the whole time I was like, wow, where are we going with this? Koshi, you're just making your journey through hell. This kind of feels like Oedipus kind of just trying to, to do his travel classic Greek mythology, uh, classic mythology and general storytelling. And it does kind of have that wrap up in that same beautiful way where you get 
Um, you get to see a character really learn who they are and grow. So you have characters learning who they are. Dear God, I have gone back and forth a thousand times about whether or not this is going to be in the picks of the week. You could just throw it there if you wanted to, but this is issue four of Chroma. And also an image a comic. This is from the Skybound imprint. And goodness gracious, Skybound, you are killing it right now um, with your titles. But this is the end of Chroma. And this is a story of a world where we've been told that monsters exist that are trying to kill things and the way uh, kill humans and the way they hunt them down is by looking for color and so everything in our society has been ashened out and even our food everything and every year we take out the monster and we beat the monster and it's supposed to hold everything at bay but in the very first issue our character that our story is told from um in issue one he discovers that the monster isn't what he's always been led to believe that it was and he is opened up to reality and to the fact that the world is bigger than just black and white and kind of leads us into our adventure and our our storytelling through discovery and as we follow this growth into the world of color and we develop who we are as people uh we come back for everybody else in this issue in issue four and we come back to tell the rest of the people you don't have to live like this we need to learn to work together everything you've been told that's to divide you isn't true and as long as you allow somebody else to dictate what you believe and who who you believe in, um, you will never work together and you will never experience the world. Uh, great story, beautiful story, and the use of color is done phenomenally. It's this is when we talk about comics as art. This is definitely one of those books that uses every element of the medium to give us what we need. Uh, our last book ending this week is All Against All, issue five from Image Comics. And this is the story of a group of aliens who, the way they have, they've been in this epic battle forever. And the way that they've determined that they need to fight this battle is by taking on bodies and so they're basically inhabiting the bodies of different animals and trying to find the strongest animals that they can inhabit so that they can go to war and so they've taken over earth essentially to try to get these and now this one scientist has got his own little biome that he's growing like growing and strengthening animals in and one of those animals just happens to be a human and he has stopped sending those animals out to the war because he's trying to keep his particular human safe. And over the course of the issues, he's basically just being uh, interrogated by a general and the general discovers the human and the general, of course, wants the human. And you get a Tarzan story in space, essentially, um, with some great protection from this one alien and his daughter. So it really, I mean, it's just Tarzan at that point. You've got the Jane and you've got the dad and uh it's so good the the story we we talked about this a couple of times what's really good about it is because the aliens do all look the same they they do different colors for each of the voices um but the exploration and the build up to this i actually like that instead of following the human and what the human thinks we've been following these alien scientists the whole time and we get the story from their point of view and the story kind of wraps with their point of view and i i love the way that this wrapped up as a, as a story whole, it was all against all was really great, and you get Casper Wingard's art really leads to this weird alien con like planet that we're on. All right, yeah, we got some number ones. Let's see what launched in the last two weeks. We're gonna get there. It's gonna be great. Um, up first we have Code Name Rick Flair from Scout Comics. This is for all of you wrestling fans. If you didn't know, Ric Flair's got, there's a book about Ric Flair. Um, and he is, in this book, we find out that Ric Flair is a secret agent. 
Uh, did he have anything to do with it? Did I? No. Okay. Um, he, uh, we find out that Ric Flair has been hired as a secret agent and the whole nature boy concept is all, uh, a part of his secret agent Flair, but he is still a wrestler because they're like, oh, if we make you into this like super celebrity, you'll be able to go anywhere you want. And so this is just him kind of James bonding his way through an adventure. Uh, I have a feeling it's, set up kind of like a one shot i have a feeling we're gonna get more rick flair adventures i have a feeling this will not be the end of rick flair's story we get to see him kind of just we we get that one adventure and i would imagine that you're gonna you're gonna have to go on some more battles because you're rick flair and you get uh you got to get the girl you got to get all the stuff you get your classic classic Bond story but in the most really ridiculous way possible and um honestly this is one of those like the Ke like Berserker where I'm like read it in Keanu's voice I think you should if you know Ric Flair's voice you should you which you do if you're buying this comic uh honestly and so you should just read it in Ric Flair's voice and he does woo a million times in it so uh it's it's true to character <laughs> Um, up next, Unicorn Vampire Hunter, issue one from Scout Comics. This is a non-stop, so that means this will be the only single issue that comes out. From here, it will go directly into a trade paperback, um, or a graphic novel, however you want to look at that. Um, this is the story of a, of a young girl and her dad. And they live on the edge of the woods. And he tells her, of course, never to go into the woods because it's bad in there. She goes into the woods. Sorry. Uh, she goes into the woods and some vampires attack her. And she's saved by a unicorn who can slay, like, who can, like, slay the vampires with their horn. And we find out that this unicorn was actually once the prince of the kingdom. And he was best friends with the dad, who was his squire, essentially his knight that was supposed to protect him. And they, the dad um, was kind of the all-star knight. Everybody loved him, including the king, and the prince was jealous of him. And so the prince decided, oh, well, if this knight who has all these mad, like, is so famous and so fancy and everybody loves him because he's the magician and he serves on our front lines as a magician and my dad thinks he's so great then maybe I need magic and so he goes to a witch and he's like hey can you turn me can you give me magical powers and she's like yeah and the way she does it is by turning him into a unicorn and so the two have been at odds even though they used to be best friends and they go through all of the well I was jealous of you of this and I was jealous of you for that and now this dude's stuck as a unicorn but that works out really well because there's all these vampires and it turns out unicorns are really good at fighting vampires so um ridiculous sounding premise but actually a really well written book and I can't wait to actually grab the trade and see where this goes because I really was like, oh, man, that sucks that, like, no, it's like you wanted to be friends and you should have just told him how you felt the whole time and now you're a unicorn and, like, maybe you can get out of it. I don't know, but I really want to see these two become friends again. So. Is that a children's book? No. A lot of nonstop titles have been children's books. It's true. Um, but they have a lot of nonstop titles that aren't children's books. Uh, the Shepherd has always been a nonstop where we get, for each volume of The Shepherd, we get a single issue, which we're going to talk about in a minute, actually. And The Shepherd has never been a children's book. So, uh, And Long Lost was also not a children's book and was a nonstop. So uh, Scout did originally start as a digital publisher, so a lot of their... Books. So a lot of their books were originally only published digitally, and then as they moved into a print publisher, they they do keep some of their titles in the process of in a path where you get the single issue and then it goes to digital format. And I agree, a lot of the books that end up being in the nonstop format are the Scoot titles or the YA Scout titles, and that's because um, it's definitely easier to sell kids a graphic novel. Um, but they do have a lot of adult titles that are nonstop as well. So don't assume the nonstop logo, especially because it is kind of a little kiddish in the font. Don't as nonstop is not the name of their kid or teen imprint. Nonstop means it's going to go directly to trade. 
but you still need to check out what the age range is on the book. Scoot will be a Scout kids book, um, and they are very good at labeling their kids books, so just know if it doesn't say Scoot, it's probably not for kids. Um, up next, we have American Dreams Issue 1 from Band of Bards. And uh, this is our Band of Bards superhero book. Everybody's got one. Uh, all publishers try out like some kind of superhero line. And this is going to be our Band of Bards superhero book. And I kind of love that they look very 90s um, on it because I love when the small press books are like small press Publishers are like, hey, we've been around forever. Look at our 90s book. Um, but this is uh, the story of of some kids in um, that turn of the century, like the 1800s. There's, I guess they're not kids, but the kid generation, like the 16 to 25 year old era of the kids. And they're all in that time period where I wonder if it says the actual year 1900 exactly I was right hey turn of the century um I guess we're in a new century though so I can't use that anymore but this is uh some kids who have their family as immigrants here in the 1900s and they're dealing with all this stuff like oh uh you know we work in the factories or we work here and the sister is supposed to be they think the sister works sewing and washing laundry but she's actually working at a theater and the there's the fighting between the different groups uh, because they are in the Lower East Side and so of New York. And so there's all the in borough fighting and things that happened at the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, and one night while that is actually going on, a lightning storm hits and a bunch of the people throughout the town get superpowers. And so the different people who have received superpowers kind of start to learn what that's going to look like and how they can use it um, for good or for evil because every time somebody gets superpowers doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do the right thing. And so we're going to see how all these different people use that. I love the title of this book is American Dreams though because it is a story of people at that turn of the century where the whole promise of the American Dream was really big for immigrants coming to America and it was like oh we can promise you this whole new world and all of this stuff and then they got here and it was like hey you're going to work in factories and you're actually going to be like poorer than you were in your own country um, and then now we're these people are going to get superpowers so I want to see how they use it and see if they use it in a way that's going to help uh, deal with those situations um, super stoked again Band of Bards has just been bringing uh, fire books for all of their stuff and I am so stoked to see where they go as a publisher um, up next, Scar, a part of the new Disney Villains line at Dynamite Comics. I know that's always crazy when I say it. When I say that Disney Comics are published by Dynamite, people always look at me like I'm crazy. But here we are. Um, Scar, this is the story of exactly that. Scar, the villain from The Lion King. And this kind of picks up right at that point where he's just had that conversation with Zazu where he's like oh I should be king and like it shouldn't be Mufasa it should be me and he ends up going off and actually having an encounter with the wildebeest, wildebeest and getting kind of chased down by them and attacked much like we see Mufasa get attacked by the wildebeest and these vultures think that Scar is dead and they are like, hey, if he's not dead, maybe we can use him to our advantage. And maybe we should get him to kill Mufasa because Scar will make sure like he just likes to hunt things and leave them lying around because he kills for sport and not for food. So we'd have a lot of food as vultures if we got Scar in charge. And so we're kind of going to see that backstory of maybe this is what could have been what led Scar down the path. Uh, and use that jealousy situation that he had towards Mufasa. What I do like more than anything, though, in this book is we actually find out that Rafiki and Scar had a relationship, which is one of those things that kind of bothered me when I thought about it, about the Lion King, is wouldn't Rafiki have also been a part of Scar's life, and why didn't Rafiki just say something to Scar? Like, why didn't he just hit him on the head and be like, you're being a jerk? 
Uh, well, now we're going to actually see Rafiki do that and how that plays out in this story. And I like getting to know that there was actually some kind of relationship there with them. Uh, just so you know, there's also a Maleficent coming. Um, I'm super stoked for this whole entire villain line. It's going to be great. Um, up next, we have Lycan, Girls' Night Out from uh, issue one from Band of Bards. And if you saw Trick or Treat... And you enjoyed the werewolf story in Trick or Treat. You're uh, you're gonna dig this because it's kind of following in that same capacity of a bunch of girls who are werewolves, and they go out and they live their best werewolf life. And um, can I show that? Yeah, they live their best werewolf life, and uh, and then they wake up the next morning and they got to go about their lives. And it's kind of like, oh, I'm a mom. Like, oh, I have this job. Oh, I have this. And they think that everything is is okay. But it turns out that one of the werewolves might have gotten a little crazy during girls' night and might have uh, messed up and led to some clues being left behind that werewolves exist. And now there might be some people who are angry about werewolf existing and there might be some investigations happening and stuff going on so this is kind of what i feel like november 1st looked like for all of the werewolf girls in, in, in trick or treat like okay now we have to go back to our life and be normal people uh how did that play out here's how it plays out and also uh there is uh, some people who have just moved to town who seem to know a little bit about werewolves and uh, are putting some threats uh, and pressure onto one of the girls in the group. So I'm super stoked. I want to see where this goes. Uh, I, I I think we need uh, more books that are just about like girls getting to be the monsters and, and then just like we'll also like hey, this is what it's like. Like, you're a mythical creature, but now you're you're also a mom, and now people are putting pressure on you at your job, and your life is tough, and by the way, you're still a werewolf. Um, so I, I dig it, and I can't wait to see how it plays out. And I like that they, once again, just kind of use the red coloring as spot color for blood, and otherwise it's a black and white book. Uh, speaking of black and white books, we have Sweet Paprika, black, white, and pink issue one. Uh, from Image Comics and Marka Andolfo. Uh, we have all these black, white, and blo uh, black, white, and blood, and black, white, and red, and different books like that that have been coming out from the big two. I love that Marka, who does a lot with the big two, decided to do a sweet paprika, uh, black, white, and pink, because I love paprika so much. Um, if you have never read paprika, this is just like those black, white, and blood Marvel books it is an anthology there's three vignettes in this issue you don't have to necessarily have re read them in order or know anything about the story um but paprika is a demon who works at a publishing company and still has trouble getting to the top because she's female and nobody takes her seriously and in the main suit paprika story she is finally uh gotten there and we've met a, a wonderful cast of characters this is a great way to get to know each of them because they kind of all get a story we get a story about her dad who has struggled with finding love for a long time since him and his wife separated we get stories about paprika we get stories about her former assistant who uh is trying to figure out who she wants to be and who she wants to be in love with um, and we get some stories about the people who were kind of the villains of the Paprika story. So you get some great uh, little vignettes. And like the Marvel Black, White, and Bloods, they're all done by different creators. So you get different artists and different writers on each story. Um, and it's, it's just fun. Uh, there's no place in this world where Sweet Paprika is for children. Uh, just in case you ever wanted to know, um, it is 100% mature. Uh, Paprika's life struggle is based in her relationships, uh, so it's it's not it's it's definitely for adults only. But it is great, and you sexy. should. It's very sexy. Lots of sexy. I mean, the woman's a demon, and she has trouble talking about and having sex, and so, uh, yeah. This is a one-shot from Scout Comics. It is Crucified Exorcisms. 
And this is this is an intense book. Um, I think this is definitely another one of those that might need like a minor trigger warning uh, for where it's going. But this is all about a guy who is on a talk show and he's talking about how he does exorcisms and how exorcism takes place and all the different things that he needs to do that. And while he's on the talk show, uh, the guy who is hosting the talk show is of course challenging whether or not exorcisms are real and whether or not he does them, but he's more so challenging this man's claim that he may in fact be a representation specifically of the Christ. And this man claims that he he is that and he has he has ways to prove it. And uh, it goes on and on. This is a very oversized book. And you get to see how exorcisms work. You get to see how he plans to show that they work. And you also get to see how he plans to prove to people that he is the Christ while he's doing this interview. Um, or at least the representative of Christ. And I can't, I'm not going to tell you anything about it at all. You have to read the book. Um, but it, it, if you are able to handle much of your content and you want a really good story, I think this is, um, this was one of those where I, I got to the end and I think I even told Matt, I was like, oh man, you have to check this out. Um, I did not know that was where that was going. And like, that was, that was a really good, uh, intense story. So, um, we've got copies of it. I don't know who else has copies of it, but I, I just, it was, it was good. Um, and I can't tell you anything about it on here because I don't want to spoil it. But if you don't mind spoilers and you want me to talk to you about it, come by uh, Bat City and I'm happy to give you more of a detail about what that book was about because I think it's very, like, it's a very great story um, and interestingly written. And I think that you should check it out. Uh, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, this made my uh, top five, my live five for the week when it came out which is the uh, Great British Bump Off. And this is issue one from Dark Horse Comics. I'm not going to lie. I've only seen one episode of the Great British Bake Off that my wonderful and amazing friend Megan uh, told me that I needed to watch with her and because she watches all of them. And it's her happy, wonderful place. And I told her that this book was coming out and it was basically an Agatha Christie uh, mystery it, at the Great British Bake Off and she lost her mind. Um, so if you are also somebody who finds the Great British Bake Off as your happy place and you like Agatha Christie style murder mysteries, this is the perfect book for you. It's it's just so fun. Uh, it's uh, all the contestants, starts with all the contestants for the Great British Bake Off, but they call it something else. Um, coming in and we're getting to know all of them and excited and then on the first day the guy that's the biggest jerk is found dead in his mixing bowl uh, face down in his mixing bowl dead nobody knows what happened and one of the girls who's a contestant on the show swears that she is a great detective and she can solve the mystery by the end of the first episode as long as they don't cancel the season and so now we have a young girl who has to not only figure out how to win the competition or at least stay in the competition, she also has to figure out how to be an investigator, something she totally and completely made up because she just didn't want to lose her opportunity about being on the show. Uh, classic hijinks, great storytelling. Again, if all you're- All ages. No. If I, I will tell you if it's all ages. I mean, it's not really not like, like you could read it as like a teen. Um, I wouldn't give it to a kid, but I wouldn't give most murder mysteries to, like, most murder mysteries to a child. But so far, there's not really anything that's, like, inappropriate necessarily in it. Um, but we'll see how that goes. There, I don't even know if there was any foul language in it, honestly. Um, on the opposite of the spectrum, something I definitely know is not kid-friendly. Uh, the giant Coke Jew from... Uh, issue one from Image Comics and specifically Gary Duggan and Scott Koblish. So you know, K-O-K-J-U. Uh, so you know this is this is the team that brings you uh, the secret history of weed and the, what is it, Scott McTaggart uh, books. So I that is your warning that this is not 
kid friendly at all, which is why we're talking about it at eleven fifteen at night and not uh, in the morning. But this is the story of of a kaiju who has decided that. You know, we don't really take care of the environment and we don't deserve to live on this planet and is what this kaiju has decided because we're not doing what we need to do to protect his earth and so maybe humans don't need to be on it. So uh, this is a double page spread of a kaiju pooping acid and killing humans with said acid. Um, so he is going through the city and he is pooping acid all over them and killing people. And it is, uh, it's, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. Um, this was, I will say this was without even reading it. He already told me this was Wednesday Phil's pick of the week. He's been waiting for this book for months. Uh, and, or maybe more than that. But this is the story of, it, it takes everything that kaiju books, kaiju books and kaiju movies does, do, or does, yeah, does. Um, when they talk about, you know, oh, humans have destroyed the environment, like kaijus are here to bring balance back to it, like they, you know, oh, we did a bad thing and kaijus want to, like, correct that. It takes all of that, except it does it in that ridiculous, ridiculous way, um, I left out the middle of the book because there are other ways that the kaiju decides to destroy humanity. And um, uh, long story short, they use the reference to the fact that they are screwed. And uh, that's about what I'm going to tell you about what that goes down. <laughs> uh, so if you are an adult who wants a parody of kaiju books with some good art, uh, you should definitely check that out. Uh, but please do not share it with your kids who like kaiju books. That is not for children at all. <laughs> In no way, shape, or form. But there are lots of Godzilla books and kaiju books that are kid-friendly if you are looking for something. Um, another one-shot, I believe. I believe it's a one-shot. Um, yeah. This is All the Devils Are Here from Scout Comics. And this is a Marco Fontanelli cover. Uh, I got really excited because I was like, oh, Marco Fontanelli. And then I was like, oh, just the cover. Um, but who cares because it's still a great book. Um, this is 44 pages of great story about a man who has dementia. And while, being, uh, while having dementia, he gets possessed by a demon. And a gentleman who is an exorcist comes in to save him. And the way he does his exorcisms is he actually goes into the mind of his patient, which is really interesting because this man does have dementia. Um, and he is actually has three demons that reside within him. And so this man and his demons go inside a man with dementia and are trying to, like the only way they can save him is by getting him to work with him. He's like, I go into the patient's minds and they they help me fight the demons. But this man doesn't know how to use his mind in the same way anymore. And so he has to basically help him put his mind back together uh, long enough to get him to help him fight the demons. Which was a, a beautiful story to see how that goes together and to see all the things that the man was like, oh, I really miss having like these things in my life and so uh I can't focus on anything um long enough to help you and then them kind of like getting all that put together it was just absolutely great I I actually am kind of like oh man it would have been great to have a, a full run of that of this guy going and doing more things like that um up next this one is actually a kid-friendly book uh, this is this new scoop title and it's called Mechaton and this is the story of um, a bunch of, of a bunch of kids with some mech suits. Um, so this is I'm gonna flip this open. This is a brother and sister. Um, they I think it's maybe we'll say siblings. Yeah, brother and sister. And the older brother is obsessed with video games, and he's supposed to, he's kind of just got like this great personality like he works at a pizza place and uh he and it's one of those where that they have a 30 second or, le or 30 minute or less delivery and he knows who in town needs financial assistance so he kind of 
if they order a pizza, he takes his time on purpose. Like, he literally stands outside their house and won't deliver it until the 30 minutes are up so that they get free pizza. And one of the days when he is doing just that, uh, a glove falls from the sky and him and his sister discover and it kind of looks like the Infinity Gauntlet and they put it, he has to end up putting it on because giant monsters also show up and he basically gets his own mech suit and is able to uh, fight these monsters but he's not very good at it and they are working together to kind of figure that out. This is, it's super cute. Um, it's, it's, says it's YA and I think that's probably a fair assessment because it is kind of um it's got some joke just the jokes you might not get if you weren't a teenager but and the characters are teenagers but I don't think it's necessarily anything that would be inappropriate uh for younger than that so if you have some kids who love mech they would love it but also I thought it was hilarious and extremely endearing uh, for a first issue and that is a non-stop so it is going to go from that to a trade paperback as well um, up next, we have Plan Plan 59 from Outer Space, Issue 1, and I Dren, Produ Dren Productions is the publisher. Um, this is another one of those, like, new publishers that um, I'm super stoked to see. I guess they're not, I don't know if they're necessarily new, but they're new to us. Uh, we've had a few. We've had a few. We had uh, The Unwanted, for sure, from them. Um, I'm super stoked about the concept of this book. I love, obviously, I was sold when I saw the cover uh, in in the previous catalog, but this is the story of a, of a girl. Uh, it starts out with the story of a girl who is, fights like she's being attacked by some in, intruders in her house, and then it turns out that they are uh, monsters, and it turns out she's actually a super qualified monster hunter. And then we find out that aliens are coming, and the aliens have been laying in wait knowing that we made it super easy for them to take over because we have all this technology, and if you just hack the technology and put mind control into our technology, we all are obsessed with it. So, of course, we're going to immediately see what we're doing um, and what they want us to see because they, they can just hack that technology. And she happens to just break her phone. Uh, and so, you know, leading into this next, whatever, as the tech, like, as the aliens happen, like, she's not going to probably be possessed by the aliens because her phone is broken. Um, very pulpy, very fun. Um, I, I'm super stoked for it. I, I think that, these, like, the classic 1960s movies and that classic feel of pulpy comics always gets me every time. Um, and so when I saw this, like, the writing and the cover, I was like, oh, my God, this is going to be, like, a 1960s, either a parody or just true to that movie. And while it does feel like a little bit of, mo like, obviously modern elements because we have cell phones in it, it still kind of stays true to that storytelling fitting into what the 1960s movies looked like. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait to see what issue two contains. We've got Griffin galaxy's most wanted issue one from what Not's massive publishing line, not to be confused with the massive verse from image comics, totally different. Um, and I think that's why what Not's not really pushing the name of that, uh, publishing imprint. Uh, and they're just kind of, putting the whatnot publishing bigger because uh, it's it's a little confusing with the Kyle Higgins thing. But this is the story of, of a person who has been imprisoned. And essentially it's honestly just because she hates the patriarchy and she's willing to fight against it. Uh, and people are mad that that she's fighting them because she's like killing people that are bad guys. And the, there is a guard working at the prison that she's in who is like, Hey, you hate the patriarchy and you hate all of these people in charge. And I've got a rebellion unit. Would you like to come work for us? And she's like, absolutely not. But you can come work for me when I, when we, when you break us out of here. And so there's prison break. They end up on a spaceship the girl is like, hey, now that you're free, like, you should work for my rebellion. And she's like, no, I already told you that I'm not going to do that. 
And then we get to see the home planet of the the girl who has recruited her to work for the Rebellion is in danger. And when she asks the Rebellion to help, their whole thing is, well, they're not really going to do anything for the cause. And saving them doesn't really help us in any way. So we're like... Their, their problem isn't really our problem because that's not what our rebellion is. And they're like, so if they die, like, we don't really care. And she's like, I thought our whole point was to, like, help people. And they're like, no, our whole point is to get our cause further, not all causes further, uh, which I, I love that conversation. And then she's kind of like, no, my goal is to help humans like or aliens or whatever we are. Uh, just people, people in, in general. And so they kind of start their own little ragtag group. And honestly, from everything that's come out from What Not Publishing so far, this is my favorite. This is the one that I am like, I cannot wait for issue two. I love this. I love Griffin. I love the, I love the entire crew. Um, and everything that, that is going on in this book has, so far has been, it, you still have the hilarious, like, crass humor um in a lot of it but you also have a heart that i think we've been missing in some of the the funny the over the top funny books that we've had so far from a lot of the whatnot publishing books and so i'm really excited to see where this one goes um can't wait this is a good start for an issue one and um i can't wait let's see what issue two does Ziltoid, the omniscient Opus Comics new number one. And that is also a band uh, that does this. So this is another one of their, their rock-related uh, albums uh, or album-related uh, stories. But this story is all about Ziltoid, who is a young alien who doesn't feel like he fits in. And he is from a planet where they use coffee. Do they have a picture of it? No, uh, not really. But they basically use coffee beans to create babies on this planet. And so they're all kind of born of coffee beans. And he's told that, like, oh, there's this great... He tells us there's this great prophecy. I'm going to create the greatest... Uh, I'm going to change the world and I'm going to be wonderful. And then we see this whole story about how he's like this great mathematician mathematician, and he's doing all this stuff because their whole race is the people who keep time essentially from folding in on itself. And then uh, it breaks down and we actually see that he just wrote a bunch of gibberish on the board when he has his like goodwill hunting moment where he solves the equation and they're like, you didn't even write anything on there. That's just like those are made up symbols. It's not even math. And his home life is terrible. And so he ends up trying to wander off and run away. And he finds another alien who, much like him, laughs and enjoys life and is obsessed with human stuff. And in his treasure trove of human goodies, he discovers that the guy has a guitar. And he's like, oh, my God, what is that? I love it. I want to play this guitar. They, I want to figure out what it is. I want to live with this thing. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen. And the guy's like, no, it's the most dangerous thing in the whole wide world. Like, your whole life will be destroyed if you play this thing because you'll never care about anything but that guitar and playing music. Like, you can't do it, dude. And uh, Ziltoid decides he doesn't care. He's going to go for it. And so that's kind of where we start. Is like the world might come to an end, but Ziltoid's like, I gotta play, and she will be mine. Oh yes, she will be mine. It is Ziltoy the Omniscient is an album by Devin Townsend. And Devin Townsend is the lead singer and guitar player of Strapping Young Lad, which is a band that was very famous in the 90s. Devin Townsend has gone on to have a very successful progressive rock career. Since then has played on tons of progressive rock albums as uh, a featured guitar player and Ziltoid the Omniscient was just an album that he had, a concept album. Do I need to repeat all of that? Do you think? Okay. Hopefully you heard it. <laughs> uh, and if you didn't, Matt just said that Ziltoid the Omniscient is an album by Devin Townsend, uh, who is a guitar player who has played with a lot of people. Um, Strapping Young Lad. Strapping Young Lad was Devin's band in the 90s. 
And now Ziltoid. I had a lot of people, that is one of the Opus comics that a lot of people came to me and said, are you getting Ziltoid the Omniscient? So just so you know, I'm always getting Opus comics. Um, but please let me know that you want them because I was super stoked for the fact that so many people were like, oh my God, I, can I just subscribe to Ziltoid before it even came out? So, um, Devin Townsend's great. Vote of confidence for Matt. There you go. Matt, you should read the book because it's hilarious. Probably would have been a Phil pick of the week because it's so funny. Um, speaking of the Scout nonstops, uh, The Shepherd, The Tether, issue one, a nonstop title that will go into Trade River Rat. I'm not going to lie. I have read every one, like number one for The Shepherd, uh, but never read the Trade River Rat. And so I've never, I've only gotten the number ones and I actually feel like I still have like, it's like if you cap capture like every like sixth episode of a TV show and you're like, no, I totally know what's going on. But like at the same time, you really don't actually know what's going on. It's kind of where I feel like I am right now with The Shepherd because I have read all of these one shots. But in this uh, particular issue, we are following a young boy who is, um, I mean, specifically, like, this, oh my gosh, so sad. Um, the shepherd in general, I guess I should start with, is, is the shepherd as in, like, leading you over to the other side. And in this one, we're kind of seeing these, this young boy who's the son of the shepherd, who has that same power of leading people to the other side and kind of seeing what it's going to be and, and fighting off ghosts and demons and, and not knowing how to deal with that. And I, what I like about the shepherd is that it kind of, it kind of gives you that a lot of, oh, well, these are people who deal with death all the time and yet they still don't really know how to handle it and how to, how to express it. And this boy is, is dealing with exactly that in here because he's he's got all these things that tether him to our world, but he also has all these things that tether him to the world of the dead and he's not really sure like where he belongs. And I think it's really cool because the, the dad has always been like, oh, like this is this is how it works and this is what we do and it's just, it's just that, it's, this is what we do. But, you know, not every teenager wants to do exactly what their parents do and when you're stuck in like that world of, oh, well, I have to do this death thing, not necessarily their favorite thing. Um, but I like, I, I really need to just sit down and read all of the trades for the shepherd because I love this concept of this character and I want to get into it for sure. Um, up next we have, I'm going to skip that because I'm going to put that over there because we don't need to talk about that because it's just amazing and I'm just going to say that when we get there. Up next we have uh, the return of a couple books starting with Second Coming Trinity. This is issue one of volume three of Second Coming and this is the story of Sunstar who is kind of like Superman and his roommate, Jesus Christ. And at this point in the story, Sunstar has had a baby and Jesus is no longer his roommate, but Jesus is his best friend. So he is still the babysitter for his kid. And in this particular issue, Sunstar is on a, is on a, uh, he's a key witness against Cranius, who's on trial, who is, Cranius is the villain. And he's kind of going through here and realizing for the first time that he might be just as much at fault because he was kind of not a good person as Cranius, in Cranius's development into a villain as Cranius is. Because you go back and you see like their high school reunion and they talk about not only how mean he was to Cranius in high school, but how mean he is when Cranius is trying to even get out of being a bad guy in real in adulthood and Sunstar is kind of just a bully but he thinks he's just like being funny and there's this whole thing in here where Jesus and is on the phone with Sunstar and I'm trying to find it um and he's he's talking to him and, and Sunstar is like oh well I really want I don't know what to do because I I realize now that it might be just as much my fault that Cranius is a bad guy as it is his fault and I don't feel like he can get up there and testify and say like oh this is just a bad person and he's like what is it that like 
you know, you always talk about like compassion and forgiveness, like, and like, when do I forgive somebody? And, and Jesus tells Sunstar, like, I used to talk a lot about forgiveness in the old days, but more importantly, I preach compassion because compassion lessens the need for forgiveness. Forgiveness, when all is said is, and done, is just compassion failed. The last guardrail before we all head over the cliff. Forgiveness is wonderful, but it doesn't always work. There is a line beyond which we are no longer capable of it. A line beyond which, even if forgiveness is given, it cannot be accepted, for it changes nothing. A little compassion keeps us from needing forgiveness, keeps us from the line where forgiveness no longer works, which is important because we never know where that line is. And it leads us into where this whole entire arc is going to go on the superhero side. Side, But I just, I absolutely love how Mark Russell makes this incredible satire, but still gives us these really great moral lessons, like blended into it, because you're like, it, the conversation of forgiveness versus compassion is always a really great one. And Mark Russell has done such a great job with this book the whole time of being like, it's, I love the teachings, but I was never really sure like where they were supposed to go and like kind of applying it to the modern superhero world. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, grab volume one and two of Second Coming. It's one of my favorite comic books of all time. All time. Uh, love that book. And I probably don't have any in stock because I sell it all the time. So I will order more uh, because we, you need to read it. Uh, up next, returning to us is Love, Love Everlasting, issue six from Image Comics and uh, Tom King and Elsa Cartier. Uh, this is such a cool book. It is all about a woman who falls in love over and over again every time she gets to the perfect love of her life moment and is going to get married. She wakes up. Uh, or she is killed and then wakes up in a completely different world and a completely different story. They're all romance novels. And I love it because in the issues, you always get the new one always has a different uh, title. And they do that classic comic thing where it's like, oh, I just learned that I was. And then it's the title of the book. And in this particular issue, uh, at the end of volume one, we kind of started to see what was actually happening and why she's waking up on all these different realities. And in this issue, we see the whole thing completely change. Uh, shocker, I know Tom King gets halfway through the series and completely mixes it up. I know, we're all surprised. Oh my God. Um, but this goes in... The completely opposite direction of everything we've seen. And I'm not going to show you anymore because I want you to read it because this book is so good. Uh, we just did a book club for uh, our $1 book club read issue one of this, which is not an image first yet. And I know I told you at the very beginning, if you were watching this, that we do image first for our book club. But we made this uh, our own image first and we charged a dollar for the first issue of this just so people could read it. And everybody that read it is now subscribe to this book and try and figure out what is happening. And I can't wait for them to all read this issue and have no idea <laughs> what's going on all over again because that's what Tom King does and it's wonderful. So read All of Everlasting because it's great. Uh, also returning this week is End After End issue 6 from Vault Comics. This is what if you were essentially sucked into a world like a D&D &D campaign and now suddenly you were having to be a part of this quest and you were told essentially that you're the chosen one and that the source of all darkness in the end after end, which is what they call the world, um, is coming after you and is coming after the people and you're the only one that can save it and every time you try to do the right thing, you end up making it worse and um you know that you're the only one who can do it like the magical items that are needed to do it find you much like in a campaign where everything seems to work out and yet never work out that's what you get in end after end i think you should check it out if you are a DD player you were gonna love this Briar returns to us this week with issue four from boom studios and christopher cantwell this is the story of Briar Rose, the Sleeping Beauty, as she is, uh, if what if Sleeping Beauty had not actually been awakened by the prince? What if the prince decided he was just going to take the kingdom and he was going to let Sleeping Beauty sleep for the hundred year curse? Now she's woken up a hundred years later. Everything has gone to crap. 
she is trying to figure out how to survive. She's got her own witch friend and a character who is known as Spider, who is a part of a new magical race. And they are trying to retake her kingdom. But at the same time, she has found out that her evil fairy godmother, who we know is Maleficent, who has a different name in here because that is copyrighted by Disney, uh, is still out there and it's still coming for her. And she is going to have to face that evil evil entity on her uh, on her own or with her friends up to her but she does have to take that battle on if you haven't started briar yet you're only four issues in um it is very heavy in the fantasy style writing but it is an adventure that i definitely think is worth going on especially if you are a fan of sleeping beauty uh lastly returning this week we have issue five of dark ride the first issue in this new uh arc and this is from Image Skybound. I told you, Image Skybound is killing it right now. Um, this is Joshua Williamson bringing together the worlds of both Disney culture and horror. What if Walt Disney had decided he was... Like, what if Walt Disney was possessed by demons and he wanted to make a horror park? And in this issue, we find out um, how his children, uh, Halloween and Samhain... A.K.A. Sam, because that's definitely not how you say Samhain. Um, how uh, Hall Halloween and uh, Sam become were, were born and how they got to where they are now. And we see Sam and Halloween as they are trying to run the park in their dad's place and deal with all of the evil. And one of them being more into it than the other. Uh, one who wants to actually run a business and one who's into all of the like demonology of the park and believes that side of it. I'm not showing you the second half of the book because A, I don't know if Matt has read this issue and I don't want to spoil it, but also B, I don't want to spoil it for you because we find out a little bit more about where um, the dad has gotten all of his evilness from. So check it out. If you haven't read this, it's fantastic. Uh, Matt sat down and read the whole like trade in in like an hour and was like oh my god i love that book that was so much fun so uh first trade. the first trade the issues one through four uh which is out and does exist and i do have a copy of so if you need a copy of volume one so that you can jump into this i actually have the issues and i have the trade worth however it. <laughs> worth it is what matt says i like the trade because it has a map um, a couple of uh, BatFam members actually talked to Joshua Williamson about how he designed the map when they were at Megacon and all the things that were on it and whether or not they would come into play into the story. So uh, I think that's super cool. All right. I have a stupid amount of picks of the week, and I'm going to go through them as uh, quickly as possible. I'm um, trying to separate them by the week. Okay. So that I can actually get this. We're just going to do them in order of last week versus this week. So up first uh, is Junk Rabbit issue one. This was part of my live five and rightfully so it is part of the picks of the week. I'm super stoked for this book. I want to see where it goes. But this is um, the story of, of us ruining everything. <laughs> As per usual, that's going to be the story. All of my picks of the week all the time. But no, this is... Uh, we, as Earthlings, uh, develop too much product. I want to see if I can find that picture. I, I guess it's just this one. Um, I think there's a double page spread of it. But we, as Earthlings, develop too many things. And then we just throw them away because we're wasteful. And we create all of these junk sinkholes. So much so that eventually... People who have money just move off the planet because they don't have anywhere else to go. And then the people who don't have money, uh, who have just like a regular amount of money, get to move into these dome cities where they're protected from all the trash and all of the smog and pollution. And then people who don't have any money have to live amongst the trash. Ah, there it is. There's my double page spread of it. And they've now built these cities out of trash and within the trash. And of course... Uh, an influencer on the social media of the future is out in the in the slums of the the junk, um, as they call them, and is murdered while doing his live show. And so, as these people come out to investigate, 
they uh, start looking into what's going on in these in these trash dumps. And of course, they don't take any of it seriously. Meanwhile, we meet our main characters, who are two sisters who live in in the trash heaps world um, and the trash cities, and they are trying to keep their their heads above water and deal with it. And one of the sisters has a boyfriend who the other sister had been in love with forever. And they, the ones, one of the sisters really hates seeing how the, the people of the dome cities mistreat the others and is trying to do her part to help people out. Uh, meanwhile, during all of this, we find out that there is a legend of a superhero called the junk rabbit and the junk rabbit is someone who has been built out of trash and shows up to defend the people of the trash city and the mystery of not only who killed the person, but who is the junk rabbit is going to be what we find out. And I love this book. I love the setup. I love all the characters. I can't wait. Big world. Big world immediately. Um, and I, I cannot wait to see how much that's going to come into play because you, you nailed character development, you nailed world building. Uh, I feel like I've known the history of Junk Rabbit. Like, it's one of those where I was like, was there already a Junk Rabbit series? And this is like a rebuilt boot of Junk Rabbit because I felt like the world was so big immediately that I couldn't, like, I was like, there has to be more to this. So, you got to grab this issue one. Uh, up next, we've got the Nasty Issue 1 from Vault Nightfall imprint. I'm going to be honest, I'm 39 years old. I'll be 40 this year. If you set your book in the 90s, I automatically, like, where people are teenagers in the 90s, I'm already going to be a sucker for it every time. Uh, but this one I've been waiting for uh, because I got to talk to Vault about this book a lot. And the more I talk about it with people, the more I love it. This is the story of, of a group of friends who uh, hang out at a video store. And our main character is somebody who was a kid in the 80s and his favorite thing was going to the video store and winning horror movies. And he got so into it that his imaginary friend is essentially uh, Jason Voorhees. He's a character called the, Na the Nasty. And this kid and his imaginary friend have been through everything together. And now as a teenager like in college he and his friends hang out at the local video shop still to watch horror movies and they are super like nerdy about it they have to find all of the like oh nobody's ever seen this their whole thing is to see all the ones that are like you should never watch this horror movie or your life will end kind of movies and come to find out their video store is gonna go under they don't have the funding uh, somebody wants to buy it out. It's very Empire Records. Uh, and their solution is that they are going to screen the one movie in the world that nobody has ever seen off that list that it's completely impossible to find. And they have found a copy and they're going to screen it. And if you've ever owned a VHS, you can imagine what terrible thing lies in their future as they try to screen this movie uh, for themselves prior to the arrival of all of the people for their big celebration uh, to save the theater or to save the movie, uh, the video store. And so as, as they do that, some terrible things happen and they're going to have to come up with a new plan. And the new plan that they come up with is fantastic. I love it. It's amazing. Uh, and that imaginary friend comes into play in some great big ways. I'm so stoked for this book. Uh, everything about it felt like my childhood. Like, oh, I watched a bunch of horror movies. And all my imaginary friends were, like, horror characters. <laughs> and uh, let's save the video stores. Like, I felt like I lived all of those experiences. And I'm so stoked to kind of, like, get to relive them a little bit. Uh, and just, it's fantastic. Um, up next, Hairball, issue one from Dark Horse Comics. And this book was literally pitched as, like, Junji Ito meets uh, Miyazaki, which I was like, it's Junji Ito with a cat. So, which we already have because we have cat diaries from Junji Ito. But this uh, absolutely is a, a Junji Ito style uh, American comic. But this is the story of a young girl who is adopted. 
And immediately after being adopted, her the couple that adopts her kind of starts to fall apart. They argue about everything. They're not happy with each other. The husband is like, well, I let you get the kid that you wanted, so you should be happy. And it's just a big mess. And every time the we hear about it, we hear about it from the young girl being in therapy. And she tells us that uh, she knows that they're fighting about her. She knows that they they hate her because it's ruining their relationship. But it doesn't matter because she has her bestie. And her bestie is a cat that was a stray that they found on the day that they brought her home. And they let her keep it. And the cat says, don't worry. I'm, I'm going to make sure you're safe no matter what. I don't want to show you any of the pages where something actually happens. <laughs> and she's like, I, I'll keep you safe. No matter what, you're going to be safe. Just stick with me. And so she tells her therapist, it's fine. My cat's going to take care of me. And then some really creepy stuff starts happening because cats take care of their owners and they love them no matter what. And this book is so good. Uh, I, I, 100%. If you are a Junji Ito fan, if you like that kind of manga horror, you're going to find a happy place in this. But also, if you like cats and you like horror in general, you're going to love this book. Uh, the artwork is great. The storytelling is wonderful. And it's about a cat. So, uh, obviously, it's my pick of the week because the cat isn't the bad guy necessarily. So, obviously, I love him. Um... Let's do this. Um, I always put this in Pixel of the Week, so it doesn't really matter uh, what issue number it is, but Children of the Black Sun issue 4 from Ablaze is out, and once again, I love this book so much. Um, this is the story of, of a world where we had an eclipse, and the sun was blocked out with, it was like a blood sun instead of a blood moon. Uh, but it was an all-black day, huge eclipse, and then it happened again four years later, and all the kids who were born under those eclipses seem to have these powers. And the older generation has now come to the younger generation and is like, hey, it's time. It's time for us to take over. And the younger generation is like, we just want to, we, we don't know what that means. We don't want to have powers. We just want to be nice and live and the older generation is like no we have to take over we have to fight um and now we are coming upon a new black sun one of the things i love most about this book is there have been these scientists uh in every issue who we get these they interject into the issue with scientists kind of doing their research on the black sun i love that in this one as we get to the new black sun they're like turns out we don't know anything we're just lying to you all of these theories, everything, we have no idea what's going on and we're all screwed. And we see that play out in this issue as we see the people go crazy, uh, the humans go cra like the non-Black Sun humans go crazy and we see the kids of the Black Sun really reach a new thing. Um, if you are a fan of Village of the Damned and any any of those kind of horror movies you're gonna love this book if you haven't started on it yet please grab it it's so good it's so solid every issue um because a blaze almost always is i do i can't think of an ablaze book that i didn't enjoy um and this is definitely in that same vein of like animal castle where i'm like oh my god every issue is solid and so so good same thing and, and but in horror and I, I love it. You got to read it. Children of the Black Sun. It's a great horror book. Um, up next, Know Your Station issue 5 from Boom Studios. This is the end of Know Your Station. Uh, if you are a fan of Eat the Rich, this is your same writer. And you're going to get a story that is very, uh, that wraps up. And you're like, oh, this could just be like an anthology of stories on on uh, how we could destroy the, the rich in society uh, because that's kind of what we're going for. But this is the story of, um, of a girl who works as the hospitality hostess essentially on, a, or a liaison, I should say, for the working class on a space station. And her job is to make sure that the people who are employees on the space station feel like they're getting the same quality of life that that 
and that they feel valued. And in the very first issue, someone is somebody who is one of the big wigs, uh, important like high society rich people on the ship is murdered and then so is somebody else so they bring in a detective the detective is murdered basically we realize we have a serial killer very early on and so she's like i'm not a detective but it's my job to make sure my people are safe so it's my job to do the investigation and we go through all of the issues go through an investigation of who it is and as we figure out who it is uh, which you do not figure out until this issue, so I'm not going to show you anything else. As we figure out who it is and why they're doing it, uh, the whole meaning of the entire book comes into play, and it changes the dynamic of the entire thing, and I cannot go wait to go back and read issues one through five now that I know like who did it and why they did it and what the purpose of the storytelling is you know uh matt and i talk about especially if he's on the thing the live stream with me we talk about um how the big thing in hollywood and storytelling is that they you should know what your purpose is in telling your story and you should have that message in your theme and this is one of those books where i can tell that sarah gailey like from day one was like my purpose in writing this story is this and you get to the end and you're like, yeah, it was. Oh, my God. And here you are. Like, well, we talk about in our workshops, like a surprise ending should only be a surprise ending to your readers. And uh, I know that Sarah was thinking the whole time that she wrote that, like that was going to be the ending of Know Your Station. And I'm like, dang, she nailed it from day one. And I'm so proud uh, to be a part of reading that book. So good job, Sarah Gailey. Uh, know Your Station was awesome. And you should read it if you didn't. Um, and then lastly, also from Boom Studios, we have The Seasons Have Teeth, Issue 1. This is um, going to be spoiled for you probably in this book, but uh, in this conversation, but I don't care. Um, this is the story of a man who was a war photographer, and he kind of doesn't really have anything going for him anymore. Like, it seems like his wife has either died or left him, and everybody, he's kind of on his own. He's not really doing photography anymore. He's kind of trying to work his way back in as that older man who is looking for, like, that lifeline. And in this world, the seasons are destructive. They are literally kaiju. They are completely destructive. And when they call in these... Then the seasons come in when they first land at the beginning. That's when essentially like the kaiju brings forth the season. And you're supposed to leave the town as it comes to you. And he has decided at the beginning of this book that he has nothing else going for him. So he's just going to stick around and take some pictures. And maybe that will be his way back into the world that he loves being a part of. And so he chooses to stay in this world. And we see... A little bit of his backstory we see a little of where he wants to go and we see um our first season and i'm trying really really hard to make sure i don't show you but also i every time i want to tell somebody to read this book i just show them uh that first seasonal kaiju because it's so gorgeous but i'm not going to do that because i don't want to ruin it um but great it's boom and it's one of those books where it's like this is kind of horror, but it's also kind of just a story of a human trying to figure out who they want to be and uh, where they want to fall in this world. And at the same time, I'm, I could get to issue five and tell you that was never what this book is about because it kind of feels that way at the same time. Uh, but the artwork on it. The coloring is just absolutely gorgeous. And so if you didn't check out Seasons Have Teeth, the Seasons Have Teeth this week, I uh, highly recommend you go out and grab a copy. And if you aren't sure if it's for you, just turn to the page with the first seasonal kaiju on it and you might be like, wow, never mind. I think I, I love this book. So um, yeah, read it. It's fantastic. Uh, apparently Boom Studios just really rocked it this week and that's not a surprise to anybody at all. But, yeah, so those are our picks of the week. Um, I'm going to take another drink. And now I am going to fly through these books that I have. Because I'm, I'm not, I did not bring both weeks, but I did bring 
this week's additional books that came out. So Archie and Friends had a new number one, which was the mech because everybody's doing mech books right now. So Archie has his mech book as per usual. Uh, Northern Blood issue three from Blood Moon Comics is out. This is all about uh, uh, people fighting zombie Nazis. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Usagi Jimbo have teamed up in Weirwin. Uh, yeah, Weirwin. Sorry, with with uh, the uh, hex where I always want to make sure I get my where wins, which 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 where all those things. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Usagi Jimbo, where when? Uh, this is gonna be a, a short ongoing uh little mini series of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Usagi together. Uh, Frank Bazetta has got a new, the, there's a new Frank Bazetta title from Opus Comics with tells of science fantasy. This is all of the classic things that you would expect from both of those. Uh, Radiant Black is back with issue 23. This is your uh, central point of your massive verse and uh, there is some crazy stuff happening in Radiant Black right now, but we're 23 issues in. I don't want to spoil anything. West of Sundown, issue 10 from Vault Comics. Uh, this is Tim Seeley writing Universal Monsters in the Old West. Uh, Saga, chapter 70, 63. 63. After all that long wait, we finally have some ongoing saga. And, uh, oh my gosh, Prince is, Little Prince is going to get in some trouble. Uh, Dream Master, issue 4 from Black Box Comics. And our buddy, uh, Jonathan. I love it. It's so good. Uh, Skull and Bones, Savage Storm, issue 2 from Dark Horse Comics. This is your classic uh, pirate story. And I believe, yeah, Ubisoft. It's based on a video game. A Scarlet Witch issue four out as well. Uh, Steve Orlando's run on Scarlet Witch. I love it. You've got Darcy from Thor in it as well. Masters of the Universe, Masterverse issue three is out from Dark Horse. Uh, hey Kids Comics has a new number one launching out this week and it's Howard Shaken. Those are always like kind of what happened in the comic book industry, but with like made up amalgam characters of real people. Uh, we've got Sandman Nightmare Country, The Glass House from James Tynion and DC Comics this week. Uh, Star Trek Defiance out again this, uh, again this week. Yeah, I was like, this is you from IDW. A lot of Star Trek books going on right now. It's like the resurgence of that. Carnage issue 12 out this week from Marvel. Uh, Predator launching a issue, this is issue two, but it's the launch of, a. Uh, this is the first of the Predator new books that has the 20th century movie logo. They started that, um, with Planet of the Apes last week, actually using that 20th century, not Fox, but 20th century movies logo. And, uh, this is the first time Predator has had it on there. So I wonder if we're going to see more of the 20th Century Studios, uh, logos. Wildcats issue six from DC Comics. Uh, X-Men issue 21 had an amazing Scotty Young magic variant, which, uh, you can never go wrong with. X-23, Deadly Genesis issue two. Why do we need more X-23 books? We have one. I have one in my hand, and I'm still thinking that. Superman Lost. Uh, this is issue 2 of 10 for uh, Superman. This is not your Dawn of DC Superman, but there is. So don't don't get that confused. We're on issue 2 of Dawn of DC Superman as well, but this is not connected to that. Uh, Star Wars Ewoks. This is little vignettes from the Ewoks world. You get some of your cutesy ones, but you also get some of them where they're terrifying um, because Ewoks border on that for both, uh, Miles Morales issue five with your timeless Alex Ross variant, uh, Storm Brotherhood of Mutants issue three as a part of your Sins of Sinister story. I know a lot of people have been falling into the Sins of Sinister recently. Spawn issue 340. I just learned the whole history of this character that's on here today, but I will not spoil any of that for you. Um, Marvel Voices, Spider-Verse, number one. This is apparently the cover that you're after if you're after this book because these are uh, the first cover appearances of both of these characters, I believe, uh, who are new characters like Recluse and, uh, I forgot the other one. 
Uh, Multiversity, Harley screws up the DCU, issue two is out. I sword issue three, and it's super cool. It's an action comics, a wash cover for the cover A, which I think is awesome. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, issue one. So Guardians of the Galaxy are back with a new series. I don't know why Dr. Doom's on the cover, but it's just because it's the Alex Ross variant, honestly. Um, there is a cover A that actually has the Guardians of the Galaxy. We are getting into the uh, Groot fall. There's going to be some stuff going down with Groot in the comics. Um, Fantastic Four, issue six, uh, with your Annihilus, Alex Ross cover. I know a lot of people were stoked for this one uh, coming out. Uh, and if you're uh, collecting the Alex Ross Timeless variants this week, both Thanos and Galactus are dropping. So a lot of people have been asking for both of those. Thanos and Galactus, same week, this Wednesday, Alex Ross variants. There you go. Uh, DC Universe, Lazarus Planet, Revenge of the Gods, Issue 3. That is a title. Um, that is such a long title. But here we are. This is also part of our lead-in for our Dawn of DC, which is going on right now. Captain Marvel, issue 48, Revenge of the Brood. Uh, I loved watching Captain Marvel beat up the Brood. So if you miss the Brood and your New Mutants and X-Men, they are currently in Captain Marvel. Uh, Captain America Cold War. Uh, this is the alpha of the new event with the Zemo uh, timeless Alex Ross. Bloodline, Daughter of Blade, issue 3 out this week. Batman, The Adventures Continue, season 3, also issue 3? Issue 4. Issue 4. Um, and then Batman Incorporated, issue 7 out this week. So there was a lot. There's not a lot of Batman this week compared to usual. I'm going to stand up for a second so I can grab these. We've got some trade paperbacks out this week as well. I'm going to go that way so you don't have to move this, but okay. Um... A Town Called Terror from Image Comics. Uh, this was great. This is all about a guy who um, gets sucked back into his home, and his home is the place where all of the Universal Monsters live, and he has to fight um, a bunch of bad guys. He's trying to save his mom. I can't wait to see where that goes. I know there's more to come. Uh, usually we only get, like, two issues out of Steve Niles' books, so I'm glad that we've got, like, an ongoing... Volume 1 of What's the Furthest Place from Here is out. Uh, this is such a good book from an outstanding team uh, of, of Matthew Rosenberg and Tyler Boss. And if you haven't read it, it's uh, basically kids are in a post-apocalyptic world and they all um, live in their own different gangs that are all themed around whatever place that they chose to inhabit. So record stores or grocery stores or different things. But once you get to 18, you have to go out into the wild, um, and disappear because, and nobody knows what happens after that. We are, uh, we are way further in on the series itself. So if you need to catch up, that is a great way to do it. Speaking of catching up, Volume 1 of Vanish is out now from Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman. So if you haven't checked this book out yet, this is Issues 1 through 4. Just dropped. Great time to get into it. Buffy um, has a new series called The Vampire Slayer, which is actually written by Sarah Gailey, who wrote Know Your Station and uh, Eat the Rich. So if you... Um, are somebody, this is Buffy has lost her powers and a new slayer has to take up the mantle. So who will be the vampire slayer? This is what we're figuring out in this book. Uh, Breakout from Dark Horse Comics. This is one of those books that was a pick of the week multiple times, even though it's only four issues long, about a group of kids who have to ocean this 11 their way into saving uh, their siblings from an alien invasion. We only find them when they're dead, volume three. If you didn't get to check out Al Ewing's uh, beautiful uh, story with Simone DeMeo about gods, like galacticized gods who are dead and, and the harvesting of them, this is a... Uh, this is it. This is the this is volume three. Um, we have one and two, I believe, as well, but you should definitely check that story out. Stuff of Nightmares from Arl Stein. You had your Goosebumps, you had your Fear Street. Now Stuff of Nightmares is your adult version of your Arl Stein. This is all four issues of the first volume of that. Cannot wait for more. Uh, very Frankensteinian. Uh, Arl Stein does Frankenstein, essentially. Uh, Shock Shop, ish, uh, Volume 1. Uh, this is Cullen Bunn at Dark Horse, and he is giving us 
a kind of a creep show kind of thing, but each, like we talked about earlier, uh, issues one through four has two stories in it. Both stories continue through all four. I love that they actually did the same thing on the trade that they did on the issues, and the trade also has two different covers, uh, which is super, super cool. I love our uh, Crypt Keeper type character because she works in a haunted comic shop, and I think she's super cool. Um, but these were great stories, so if you haven't read that yet, you get essentially eight issues for the cost of four in a trade. And finally, volume one of Superman Son of Kal-El is in trade paperback. So this is issues one through, is it six? Is it? It doesn't say. Uh, yeah, first six issues of Superman Son of Kal-El from Pal L from Tom Taylor. Uh, everybody was really into this. I know it's hard to find those early issues, so now's your chance to grab them. Um, there you go. We've got, uh, like I said, a bunch going on at Bat City coming up soon. Um, we've got our Family Fun Day, our Academic Adventures Reading Academy on April 29th from 12 to 4. We've got our educator seminar on April 27th from 6 to 8. We've got $1 book club going on uh, 8 p.m. on that Wednesday, the 26th, where we are reading Hell Cop issue one from volume three, the image first of it. It's going to be a ton of fun. I love talking about all these books with you, um, obviously. Thank you for sitting through me talking about two weeks worth of books. There was a million of them, and they were all good. It's not my fault uh, that I love comic books. If you want to talk about any of them in more detail, come by the store. I will be here this Wednesday for New Comic Book Day to talk to you about all of the new releases and every other book that I've ever loved. Can't wait to talk to you about it. want to hear about all the books you're loving, too. Um, until then, have a great week. Happy reading. Uh, bye. I take a drink, but I don't have any wine. <laughs>